very good evening and thanks to everyone for joining us today. I, Ankit Dogra, along with my teammates, Dr. Deepika Chhabra and Mr. Amit Saxena from Medical Services and Mr. Vinod Upadhyay, Zonal Sales Manager from Jackson Pal Pharmaceuticals Limited, are delighted to welcome you all to today's Pan Symposia on Gestational Trophoblastic Disease organized by Isopap Kanpur along with Isopap Prayagraj and Lucknow. The academic partner for today's program is Jackson Pal Pharmaceuticals Limited, makers of Divatron, 10 mg tablets of indigenous and affordable micronized didrogestron for a safer and smoother journey to the motherhood, along with injection maintain. 250 and 500 mg depot 17 alpha hydroxy progesterone caprovate to maintain pregnancy till term and lycoprid preg sachets of l arginine lycopene and dha for high risk pregnancies we extend a warm and hearty welcome to all the esteemed speakers experts and the attendees dear attendees we request you to post your queries opinions or suggestions by the text in the Q&A box. Please note, this webinar is streaming live on the Facebook and the link has been shared in the chat box. To refer to this webinar in future, please visit our YouTube channel, Jackson Pal Medical Insights. Now, we take a moment to thank the office bearers of Isopap Kanpur for associating Jackson Pal Pharma to be the academic partner today. We thank uh, President Dr. Neelam Mishra, ma'am, Secretary and Moderator Dr. Kiran Sinha, ma'am, Treasurer Dr. Vinita Avasti, ma'am, and the Quad Co Moderator Dr. Shaili Agrawal, ma'am. And we request the moderator of the program, Dr. Kiran Sinha, ma'am, to kindly initiate the proceedings. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Hi, Dr. Kiran Sinha. Secretary Isopa of Ganpur, Chapter, welcome you all for today's webinar on trophoblastic disease. We are organizing it with Lucknow and Pragraj Isopa Society. Learning is a continuous process. More you will read, more you will learn. I will be very short in introducing everyone as each one of us are well familiar with everyone as we are organizing many webinars per day for last two years. So please allow me for that. Now I welcome my very sweet, hard-working President Dr. Neela Mishra to deliver her welcome address in short. Dr. Neela Mishra, please. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I welcome you all on today's PEN Symposium on Gestational Trophoblastic Disease in association with Isopar Prayagraj and Lucknow Society. I am honored and delighted of having been given opportunity of welcoming our chief guest, Dr. Meera Mihotri, past president ISOPAR and the founder president of WWCON. Madam is a uh, chief uh, coordinator of ethics committee and she's a teacher of teachers and patron of Kanpur Ops and Gaini Society. And Dr. Usha Sharma, our national president ISOPAR, uh, welcome you, madam. Today's guest of honor are always smiling, Professor Uma Singh. She is a professor and dean faculty of KGMU, and at present she is a president of uh, Lucknow Isopap Society. Madam, I welcome you from core of my heart. You are always helping us. When you joined GSVM Medical College as your first job as a lecturer, we were doing MS, and we were always behind you for any help and any time midnight you used to help us. Thank you, madam. I welcome Dr. Meena Savan. She's a very sincere and hardworking secretary of ISOPAR Society. Thank you, madam, for joining us. Today's session is on the vesicular mode, and speaker is none other than Dr. Subohi Kuroi Kureshi, professor and head gynae oncology, KG Ami Lucknow, and the chairperson for this session are Dr. Usha Goenka, President Kanpur of Sangani Society, and Dr. Ramnit Kaur Ahuja, Joint Secretary Kanpur of Sangani Society. There is a brilliant panel discussion on the gestational trophoblastic disease, whose moderators are none other 
our own Dr. Ranjana Khanna, President of Isopark Allahabad and ex-Vice President of North Zone Fauci and Dr. Parul Khanna, Communicator, Isopark Prayagraj. The experts of this panel are Dr. Kiran Pandey, Professor and Head of Department of GSVM Medical College, Gaini, and who has joined us in spite of our busy schedule. Thank you, Dr. Kiran. Our next expert is Dr. Nisha Singh. She is a unit in charge of Genital Cancer Control Unit, KGMU Lucknow. I welcome you, madam. Today's we have got a galaxy of panelists. And of these, Dr. Uh, uh, number one, Dr. Gauri Gupta, Dr. Shweta Gupta, Dr. Tarstub Shirvastro, Dr. Richa Bhalla, Dr. Vaishali Saxena Elhabad Isopa, Dr. Rekha Sachan, Professor and Unit Head of KGMU, and Dr. Swati Gupta, and uh, so, so thank you. Over to you, Kiranji. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Neela Mishra. You are always so sweet. You always give me free hand to work. That is why I am able to do any work. Thank you so much. Now I invite my chief patient, Dr. Meera Agniyotri, ma'am, as chief guest. She is a motherly figure to all of us, full of love. No flyer can be completed without her. She always encourages every one of us to do more and more and more. Ma'am, I request you to please and say a few words of blessings to this audience. Dr. Meera, ma'am. Uh, thank you very much. My dear Kiran and Neelam for making me a part of this uh, power packed this academic session. I so power with a triad present over there of Kanpur, Allahabad, and Lucknow. A wonderful triad with no distances in between. You can put them together and say one because most of the friends present over there, whether they are in Allahabad or they are in Kanpur. They were with us in Kanpur. They are with us and they will always be with us. So it is a, just an arbitrary demarcation between Allahabad, Kanpur and Lucknow. I always treat them as one. Uh, friends, it's really an honor uh, for me to share the dais. Uh, with Dr. Usha Sharma, uh, a very smiling face. I always love uh, to be by her side. Uh, her very presence speaks volumes about the work she has uh, done for the society and she is still continuing. Uh, your posts keep on coming and going, but your work doesn't stop. It will continue forever because hardworking persons they always find one or the other reason to make it fluent. And Usha Sharma is one of them. She may Thank occupy you. the post, she may not occupy the post, she may be at any post, but she will be with us working virulently for uh, this thing. Dr. Uma Singh, uh, my, I'll say, younger colleague now, uh, she started her career uh, as a lecturer with us at GSVM Medical College, Kanpur. Uh, and we have got a very lovely memories of this charming young girl joined as uh, assistant professor with us. And now she's HOD and Dean of King George's Medical College. Dr. Meena Samant, National Secretary of ISOPAR, makes a wonderful combination with Usha ji. And they are complement to each other and they keep on doing the work. I uh, just extend my good wishes for them to be with us. Our office bearers, we are all fully aware. Neelam is the president, Kiran Sina is the secretary, and Vinita Avasti and Shaili Agrawal will be participating actively to make this uh, Congress a wonderful this thing. Vinita and Shaili are smiling, very smiling faces. Uh, the two sessions which you have planned, Neelam and Kiran, they are really wonderful. I agree with Dr. Usha Sharma uh, that it is the need of our and demand of time. Why? Because medicine is a continuously changing phenomena. And if we are not, uh, you see, consistent with them, we will not be able to discharge our duties 
in the management of our patient for times to come. Uh, the treatment which we were told once upon a time keeps on changing today, and maybe that when our next generation comes, they may have some other uh, things to add on. First session being carried out as a vesicular mole. The speaker is uh, uh, Dr. Qureshi and chairpersons, my president uh, of Cox, Usha, Ramit, and Neelam Mishra as an expert. At the second session, gestational trophoblastic disease. Uh, I can see my Ranjana, beauty with brains, uh, moderating the session with uh, Parul Khanna. Uh, Ranjana, all of you are fully aware that her official designation is uh, past vice president of the Foxy, but she is more a part of Kanpur Optics and Gandhi Society. The panelists, Pavika, Garima, Swati, uh, Dr. Shivastav, Richa Bhalla, uh, Dr. Saxena, Rekha Sachan, and uh, Dr. Kiran Pandey, the expert with uh, Nisha Singh. Uh, I am fully confident, uh, uh, Dr. Sharma, Usha Sharma, and Dr. Saman, that we are going to receive wonderful response for uh, the audience today. And the back home messages will be very, very clear. Uh, I request uh, Kiran and uh, Neelam, uh, I believe Usha will agree with me, that whenever we uh, pro make these programs, a uh, summary like thing must be floated so that those who could not attend, they may get a line that these are some critical changes which has appeared and uh, they are now taken back. Because very many things are known to our uh, students as undergraduate, postgraduate, PMB students and so on. But a line back which must keep on changing the working pattern of our, uh, for uh, our patients must be circulated in the end so that we can give up a sum up bundle of advices to our uh, patients. Uh, Usha, I believe uh, I have uh, done justice uh, with the such a wonderful power packed uh, uh, program present to her today. And uh, I'm sure that our uh, audience will go back with wonderful energetic responses and back home messages, which they will note down in their pads. <laughs> is my suggestion. Yesterday I was attending a program for vaccination. So changes in vaccination, changes in the management of vesicular mold, changes in the gestational trophoblastic disease. You see, starting from the uh, definition up to the treatment, very many things are Change. In the very beginning, the organizers were telling about progesterone. I personally feel, believe that progesterone is one molecule in obstetrics and gynecology, which has undergone revolutionary change right from beginning to the end. It has started with the beginning of the pregnancy and is lasting uh, up to uh, the end in preterm labor and uh, things. Uh, I think Ankit, uh, who is present over here, and uh, he has tried to convey this message. Anyhow, so please uh, start the program, scientific program. I am really waiting for these wonderful, young, smart, dynamic faces to continue this program. And I ex once again extend my blessings uh, and gratitude uh, for sharing the dive with uh, Usha and Dr. Saman and uh, Dr. Uma Singh. Thank you very much once again. Thank you, ma'am, for your encouraging and inspiring words, ma'am. Now I invite my another loving, sweet chief guest, Dr. Usha Sharma, ma'am, who is National President ISOPA from Patna. She has left no stone unturned to make the ISOPA, ISOPA society to reach its side. Now, Dias is yours, ma'am. Please bless us with your few words. Ma'am Ji, you are so good that I am thinking for two minutes for two minutes. It is indeed a pleasure to be here. It is indeed a pleasure to attend today's webinar on Pan Symposia on Gestational Trophoplastic Disease where Kanpur, Lucknow and Prayagraj have joined hands together with Jess Gopal Pharma. Kanpur is a very vibrant society of isopar and to share the dais with dr meera agni hotri a stalwart that is an honor for me i am very happy to meet dr uma singh president isopar lucknow on the virtual dais today as guest of honor we 
very dynamic secretary, Dr. Meena Samal. I congratulate President Dr. Neelam Mishra and Secretary Dr. Kiran Sinha. Whatever I say in her praise is less. That is all I have to say about her. Keen interest in ISOPARB activities. Your team is superb and will grow a lot very soon and always. Today's subject, GTD, is very important and we need to update ourselves with current treatment options. The learned faculties, Dr. Ranjana Khanna, Dr. Parul, and Dr. Subhi Qureshi will deal with all aspects of current management of GTDs, and I'm sure that we all will be very updated today. Now, the change of topic, I invite you all to attend the ISOPAP 37th National Conference at Varanasi on 6th, 7th, and 8th of May in large numbers to make it a grand success. It is going to be a memorable experience. This much I can assure you. Varanasi has gone a sea of changes, which I think we all would like to see this time. Happy learning to all webinar attendees, and I thank you for inviting me. Long live ISOPA. Thank you. Thank you so much, Usha, ma'am. Now it is time to invite Dr. Meena Saman, who is another guest of honor. She is very loving, hardworking, National Secretary ISOPA, uh, National Secretary ISOPA, Patna, and she is very hardworking, very prompt yes. in response. Whenever I, I just ask anything, she immediately gives me answer, and that makes my work very easy. So Thank I, you, ma'am. Uh, yeah. And I really love you, Meena. Anna, now, this, 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 though you are very junior to me, but I really love you and respect you from my core of heart. Dr. Meena, please. Oops. Dr. Meena. Yeah, where I have disappeared. Yeah, no, no, I can see. I can see. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, <laughs> good evening, one and all. Respected President Kanpur Chapter of ISOPAR, Dr. Neelam. Respected uh, Secretary, Dr. Kiran Sinha, our Chief Guest, Dr. Meera Agnihotri, Madam. Uh, she's a teacher of teachers and very much dedicated. I remember last in one of the meetings, she was not well at all, but she made it a point to attend and give the address. And Usha Sharma, ma'am, always enthusiastic and always blessing us all and guiding us all along. And uh, thank you, organizers, for the opportunity to be here with you all today. And the subject, oh, I mean, and it's so nice to see all Allahabad, uh, Lucknow, and Kanpur together uh, to make this wonderful, um, uh, you know, scientific bonanza happen. And today's topic is a little different. And yes, some new things that have come up in a vesicular mole or molar pregnancy. Uh, I, it was one of the hot topics as we, when we were the PGs and things have changed so much. And yes, we do need to keep updating ourselves because, you know, even if it's not directly perinatology, but its implications, they do impl have an impact and um, any pregnancy event uh, can be complicated and we need to know all the ins and outs. So uh, thank you today. And as Secretary General of ISOPARB, I will bring greetings to you from the head office that is in Patna. And our family is growing day by day. I think it was only a few months, a few, would say, like few days back, we would say our uh, Kanpur was like a newborn baby. Now it has matured so much with all its activities. And very soon, I think we'll have another new chapter in Chhattisgarh coming up. Uh, so um, uh, uh, again, just two days from today, we have on a virtual platform handing over ceremony of our head of uh, from the office bearers. So invite, I invite you all the uh, circular and the uh, um, uh, link is being uh, given out to all our members. So uh, I request you to be there if possible. And um, now we I will not come between you and the scientific uh, program. Uh, best wishes, best of luck. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much, Dr. Meena. Your voice is very sweet. I love it. I love I love listening to you. Now, Dr. Uma Singh has not joined till yet, Dr. Deepika. 
Uh, no, no. Not yet, ma'am. Now, thank you so much, Dr. Meena. Now it is time to move to scientific session. For that, for that, I hand over mic to Dr. Shelley. Agarwal, she is very sweet. She is professor in GSBM Medical College and she joined Tejra Raisa Park. Now it is time to move forward. Dr. Shelley, I hand over mic and dice to you. Dr. Shelley, please. Thank forward. you. Thank you so much, Karansana, ma'am, for bestowing me with this opportunity. And my sincere regards to Dr. Meera Agnihotri, ma'am, Dr. Meena Samant, ma'am, Dr. Usha Sharma, ma'am, for your gracious presence. We move on to our next scientific session. For this, I would like to invite our esteemed chairpersons, Dr. Neela Mishra, ma'am. She is president of ISOPAP and a leading practitioner from Kanpur. Dr. Usha Goenka, ma'am, very sweet and very humble president of Kanpur Option Gaini Society. And very young and dynamic, Dr. Ramit Ahuja. She is also a very renowned doctor of Kanpur Society, Kanpur uh, City. I request Dr. Ramit to please introduce our speaker for our audience. Dr. Ramit. Thank you, Dr. Shelley. First of all, very good evening, Honorable uh, Chief Guest, Dr. Meera Ma'am, Dr. Usha Sharma Ma'am, and guest of honor, Dr. Meena Samad Ma'am. And I thank Dr. Neela Mishra Ma'am and Dr. Kiran Ma'am for giving me the opportunity. I thank Dr. Kiran Sina Ma'am, Dr. Neela Mishra Ma'am for giving me the opportunity. Now uh, we proceed with the scientific session. Our learned speaker, Dr. Sabui Kureshi, Kureshi will do definitely do full justice with the topic. She is the, the professor and head of the Department Oncology Super Speciality Cancer Institute and Hospital Lucknow. And she has been awarded IDCS Fellowship in Segal Cancer Center, Montreal, Canada. And she has 40 publications in peer reviewed journals. So over to Dr. Sabui Kureshi. Thank you, uh, Dr. Uh, Ramit, for those kind words. I am really blessed to be here today. Thank you, Dr. Kiran Sinha. At the outset, I would like to thank you for making me a part of this, uh, uh, this gathering. And uh, uh, none other than uh, the stalwarts, all the stalwarts are here. Dr. Usha Sharma is here and Dr. Meera Agnihotri is here chairing the She's our chief guest for the day. And I see Dr. Neela Mishra also here. And all the people who have joined today evening, I welcome you all. And I really thank you, um, Dr. Kiran, again, for making me a part of this and uh, giving me an opportunity to share my ideas uh, for this. So without wasting any time, I think we'll go to the presentation. And I've been given the responsibility of uh, speaking on H mole, which is the high degree form mole. So uh, I'll be speaking upon uh, diagnosis and management of uh, H mole. Now GTD and GTN actually is a spectrum which would include mole complete and partial. It would in include invasive mole. It would include choriocarcinoma. It would include PSTT and epithelial epithelioid trophoblastic tumor. So the spectrum starts from H mole, which could be a complete or a partial mole, and then it goes on to becoming uh, the locally invasive mole, which is locally malignant. Then we have choriocarcinoma, which has the potential to metastasize, and then we have PSTT and epithelioid trophoblastic tumor. So from an obviously benign tumor, it goes to becoming a malignant tumor. So how does this progression occur? So actually, persistent GTD is known as GTN. So GTD stands for gestational trophoblastic disease, and uh, it is uh, included in GTN, gestational trophoblastic neoplasia. It can arise after any gestational event, most commonly after molar pregnancy. So uh, it's a rare human malignancy that can be cured in the presence of widespread metastasis too. Uh, except for PSTT and ETT, all the GTN arise from syncytiotrophoblast and cytotrophoblast, and they produce abundant HCG. But PSTT and ETT, they arise from the intermediate cells of the extravelous trophoblast produce HCG sparsely. Uh, so we see how I, whenever the uh, name of malignancy comes, it is it obviously 
uh, comes with the this thing that it is a kind of a death statement, but not so when we are talking about GTD and GTN, because thankfully it's a kind of malignancy which is very chemo sensitive, and we have good drugs available. And, and now we have learned how to use uh, those drugs for controlling this kind of cancer. So now going on to the Next one, uh, the epidemiology of HMO. So there is wide variation in the uh, incidence which is reported. We see high uh, incidence in the amongst the Oriental population, amongst the Chinese groups, and also uh, amongst the Indians, as compared to what we see in the Western world. So it may vary between one to four per thousand pregnancies, and it is more frequent uh, in women at the extremes of the reproductive age. So anything which is less than the female when she's less than 15 years of age or she's mm -hmm. more than 45 years of age, the risk increases greatly once she crosses after 35 years. If there is a history of previous small, again, it increases the risk and it increases to almost 10 times. So how does h mole result? It results from an abnormal gametogenesis and fertilization. So what happens here is uh, that the maternal haploid set of 23X chromosomes is extruded or inactivated. So when we are talking about the complete H mole, there is nuclear DNA is completely paternal. The maternal DNA is inactivated. Either it is extruded out or it is inactivated. So what is left inside is the 23X, which is coming from the uh, paternal chromosome. These are the paternal sets of chromosome coming from the sperm. This would then duplicate to form 46XX. So we may get uh, uh, the progenies would be 46XX only, and it is completely paternal DNA. Now, another thing, uh, when we talk about the difference, um, when we talk about partial H mole, then it's a triploidy. And when it is a triploidy uh, in partial H mole, how does it occur? Uh, here the 23X is coming from the paternal and the 23X which is contributed from the maternal set of chromosomes. And then there would be triplication occurring and then it would occur and lead to formation of a triploid zygote and uh, the chromosome set is 69XXY. So it could be, uh, rarely it could be 69XYY also when it is fertilized by one X and one Y chromosome. And when, um, uh, as a resulting, uh, the uh, the uh, daughter, um, uh, the set of chromosome in the daughter would be 69XYY. So this is the basic difference when we talk about the complete H mole and the partial H mole. And um, when we talk uh, in terms of presentation, the H mole um, usually presents with vaginal bleeding following a period of amenorrhea. And there could be history of passage of grape-like vesicles. There could be associated hyperemesis gravidarum. When uh, we talk about signs, the patient may be pale depending upon the amount of blood loss she has experienced. The uterus would be soft. It would be enlarged to more than size of a menorrhea in about 50% of the patients. And um, in about 25% of the patients, it would correspond to the size of the uterus. And in 25, it could be even less than the expected period of amenorrhea. But usually what we see whenever H mole comes to us in our minds, we see an, uh, we, the picture which comes to our mind is that the uterus would be more than the expected size of gestation. The, uh, distinctly, we can say that if the uh, fetal parts would not be felt, the size of the uterus uh, is or is enlarged and there may be theca luteal cyst which may be detected on ultrasound on uh, there could be signs of preeclampsia because uh, this h mole is associated uh, with um, early onset of preeclampsia rather some patients in about say 13 percent of the patients they may present they may have uh, preeclampsia as a predominant feature sometimes they may have hyperthyroidism and why does hyperthyroidism occur it, you, it would occur because the TSH hormone, the thyroid stimulating hormone is similar. It has similar chains when we talk about HCG. They're all sharing the alpha uh, chains. The beta chains of all these hormones are specific, they are different, but the alpha chains are different. 
Alpha chains are same for uh, the PSH hormones and the other uh, pituitary hormones like FSH and LH. And therefore, cross-reactivity occurs and the HCG would stimulate the thyroid gland to produce more T3, T4. As a result, there is hyperthyroidism. Sometimes the patient may even present with respiratory distress. There is trophoblastic embolization or there could be thyroid storm or excessive fluid replacement leading to uh, respiratory distress. The diagnosis of H mole is usually not difficult in most of the cases when we have a history suggestive of uh, uh, amenorrhea with passage of grape-like vesicles or bleeding and we have the uh, examination findings plus the ultrasound tells us usually a very typical uh, picture. Uh, sometimes in early pregnancy, what happens is there is a blighted ovum or an, an embryonic pregnancy or a missed abortion may be, may be misdiagnosed. Uh, these things are diagnosed instead of diagnosing H mole because the picture is very similar, but this usually occurs when it is about six to eight weeks of amenorrhea. Beyond that, we see the H mole very nicely and we can easily diagnose it, but only uh, when we talk about very early gestations and nowadays as uh, the patient usually misses a period, she contacts a doctor and uh, if she has some symptoms of abnormal bleeding, uh, she is advised an ultrasound and usually there could be a diagnosis of blighted ovum or an anembryonic pregnancy or a missed abortion. But uh, per se, when we talk about H mole, it has a very characteristic ultrasound appearance of um, snowstorm appearance. And this was first described by Dodand in 1960s. And the uterus is full of dots or snowstorms, small balls would be there filled with water. So you would see them and the effect which is seen is you would feel that there is a like a snowstorm. Early second trimester, uh, 12 to 14 weeks. And uh, uh, by that time, ovaries may show theca lutein cyst. Uh, sometimes, as I just mentioned before nine weeks, the molar changes may not be evident. Failing pregnancy, an embryonic pregnancy, blighted ovum, or missed abortion may be seen. Now, uh, here is the uh, ultrasound picture. We can see here that these are small uh, bubbles-like thing we can see, and these are this is the fluid which is entrapped in these small vesicles. Uh, this is partially seen here, but here we can see very nicely the whole of the uterine cavity is replaced by these uh, small balloon-like picture. So this is a typical snowstorm appearance which we see in H mole. And uh, the, these are the typical, the, the theca lutein cyst, the ovary is enlarged and we see multiple uh, follicles uh, like, and they are all enlarged and they are filled with fluid. And this is a typical theca lutein cyst, which we see in cases of H mole. Now these are cases of uh, complete H mole, which were misdiagnosed by ultrasound as cases of an embryonic pregnancy. We can see in these pictures that the gestational sac uh, it, this could be diagnosed as a gestational sac, which is a deformed gestational sac, does not show any fetal pole. Uh, here also, although we can see uh, a fetal pole here, but otherwise it is a deformed gestational sac. And so these cases are misdiagnosed as CHN. So it is important that the implication of this is that when we do um, DNC for these patients or suction evacuation for these patients, we can send the uh, the the material, the suction uh, of the products of conception for histopathology, and that would confirm uh, whether it is mole or it is not a mole. So uh, like in UK, uh, the RCOG guidelines clearly suggest they have a clear dictum uh, from their, um, the guidelines are there, that every pregnancy which is terminated and suction evacuation uh, is done, then the products would be compulsorily sent for uh, histopathological examination for the diagnosis to rule out whether it is, uh, what kind of conception it is, whether H mole is there or not. So that is how they have, uh, because they have, uh, they're doing it for every patient. They exactly know the incidence which is occurring and they know um, uh, how often it is occurring. And that is how, when we go back, when we see the histopathological picture and then we go back to see the ultrasound picture, then we correlate and then we can learn gradually that these may suggest and these uh, patients may have complete H mole. So these are cases of partial H mole, which were again misdiagnosed and they were missed and they were said to be missed abortions. And uh, we can see here, like in this picture, the fetal pole is 
uh, developed and this could be misdiagnosed the sac is irregular and it could be easily misdiagnosed as a case of missed abortion so i've talked about this the diagnosis would include the symptoms the signs the ultrasound plus the pregnancy test the urine pregnancy test would be very uh, it's very sensitive and it would become positive very early um, with normal intrauterine pregnancy also uh, the as soon as the beta hcg in the blood crosses 50 international units uh, it may, it is detected easily in the urine and uh, the pregnancy test comes out to be positive but that actually does not tell us whether it is h mole or not a beta hcg assay helps us in telling what are the exact beta hcg values what is what is the hcg value and that helps us in making the confirming the diagnosis now when we talk about management of h mole uh, it is important to see the patient as a whole and not just concentrate on the process of suction and evacuation because she may have associated some uh, systemic uh, complications like anemia like preeclampsia hyperthyroidism or electrolyte imbalance it's important that these are optimized before the patient is taken up for the process of suction and evacuation. The, um, the treatment is obviously suction and evacuation irrespective of the size of the uterus. This used to be a very favorite question uh, when we were doing MBBS and during a post-graduation that the uterus is about say 30 weeks size or 28 weeks size. How will you do uh, the process of termination? And the student might get tricked in saying that since it is more than 20 weeks, we want to do some other method rather than doing a section evacuation. So it's important to remember that it's, it's always section evacuation irrespective of the size of the uterus. Hysterectomy is another option with which can be done with mole in C2, especially in elderly multiparas if further fertility is not desired. But a regular follow-up in all the cases is a must. So when we talk about H mole, the thing which comes in our mind is suction evacuation and then a regular follow-up. Routine prophylactic chemotherapy is not recommended and I'll talk about it in the next slides. When we talk about investigations, the patient needs to get a CBC and HCG chest X-ray to see if it is not metastasized uh, to the lungs because lungs is the most, um, most probable site of metastasis, then the serum electrolytes to rule out dyselectrolemia and associated LFT, RFT and TFT thyroid function tests have to be done to rule out any problem in these um, kidney functions or renal functions or thyroid functions. Now, when we do, a, uh, when we, after a step, the optimization of this, the patient is posted for evacuation and the suction evacuation has to be done under anesthesia, which is the method of choice. Uh, ultrasound guidance, if available, would be good and it would minimize the chances of perf perforation and would help in complete removal. Although that's not a must, that without ultrasound guidance, we cannot go ahead and do uh, the um, suction evacuation for molar pregnancy. Anti-D prophylaxis is recommended for all Rh negative patients. Again, there was some controversy in between when they used to say that RBC, the uh, H molar tissue, which is there, it is not carrying, uh, it is not expressing any D antigen. So we would not require the anti-D prophylaxis in such patients. So, uh, but now it is, uh, the guidelines are clear, very clear cut that anti-D prophylaxis has to be given. Cervical ripening is safe before the process of suction and the oxytocin has to be started during the pro process of evacuation. It helps in reduction of the risk of, uh, reduction uh, of in bleeding and the risk of perforation would be reduced. Now, uh, for the oxytocin also, we have from the very beginning, uh, when we, we were students also, we were always taught that oxytocin is a must and we started before the process of evacuation. Then came an era when in between, in somewhere around 2010 and 12, when uh, the evidence started coming up and they started saying that oxytocin should not be started before the process of evacuation. Once the process of evacuation is complete, then oxytocin should be started as it increases the chances of embolization. But all said and done, um, now the guidelines are pretty clear and they say 
except for RCOG, the, the other guideline, which is there, the FIGO guideline and the International Society for Gestational Trophoblastic Disease also suggests that the oxytocin can be started in, should be started in the beginning of the evacuation. Uh, the, the RCOG very clearly states that it has to be started only when the suction evacuation process is completed. The size of the uterus, uh, is usually more than 16 weeks, their oxytocin um, is actually more helpful. In smaller uteruses also, we can start the process. And uh, the excess bleeding gets controlled when uh, we start, the risk of excess bleeding is cut down when we start oxytocin. Now, here we can see the suction evacuation uh, is being done. Uh, is uh, The cannula is placed in the uterine cavity and the uterine cavity is filled with these uh, small vesicles and uh, the cannula is put inside the os. It's important that uh, we use a 12 to 14 millimeter cannula if the uterus size is more than 12 weeks. So um, it may be 12 weeks or anything more than 12 weeks, we would use a 12 to 14 millimeter cannula. Only when it is smaller than that, then you would go in for a smaller cannula. But usually the uterus would be around 12 weeks size. So uh, as a standard, they say that you use a wider bore cannula. That is important because if we use a thin bore cannula, then we may not be able to suction out the vesicles and it might block the uh, suction cannula and the process of evacuation would be hampered. So uh, the thing which is to be remembered is that after dilatation, gradual dilatation, which has to be done, and then <coughs> we introduce the cannula, and then we do not introduce the cannula till the uh, top of the fundus, as we do in our normal um, MTPs, we would introduce it high up into the uterine cavity, at least touch the fundus once, and then would withdraw as the classical teaching is there, and then keep it in the uterine cavity and then do the process of suction. But when we are doing for suction evacuation for a molar pregnancy, it's important to remember that we keep our cannula just beyond the internal loss. We, you enter inside the uh, uterine cavity and just keep the cannula there only. Do not take it above uh, near the uh, fundus of the uterus. Why does why is that suggested? Because the size of the uterus gradually decreases, and we all must have experienced. I'm sure all of you must have experienced. Those of you, uh, <coughs> every gynecologist uh, comes across this um, once or twice minimum during the period of post graduation, and then afterwards also. So we experience that the size of the uterus reduces on the OT table only. Like it was say 14 week size or 16 week size or 20 week size uterus. And the gradually as the process of evacuation gets completed, the vesicles are being um, suctioned out. The size of the uterus decreases. So if the cannula is placed higher up, there are chances of perforation as the uterus is very soft. So to avoid that, we say that the cannula should be withdrawn and should be kept little above the internal os only inside the uterine cavity to complete the process of suction. Gentle curettage is to be done after that and oxytocin we have talked about it. So this is the typical molar tissue which we get after uh, the process of evacuation. And uh, uh, hysterectomy, um, this is a hysterectomy specimen with mole in C2, elderly multiparous woman and uh, the important thing here to remember is it would not, the, the hysterectomy with mole in C2 would not prevent metastatic disease. So it is important that we need to do the HCG follow up for this patient also, although it would eliminate the risk of invasive mole. So uh, the next thing which is important, which comes in your mind is well, how do we do the follow up after evacuation? The next most important thing is follow up after evacuation. So it's better to keep the patient overnight in the hospital and the beta HCG uh, assay would be repeated 24 hours after evacuation. So you have one assay which is done before evacuation. Then you do one assay and again after 24 hours after evacuation, and then you have to do it weekly. The ultrasound has to be done after one week. If incomplete, then repeat curettage may be done and HCG and clinical follow-up has to be done. So the two pillars of follow-up are the clinical follow-up of the patient and the HCG, beta HCG assay. 
the important thing which needs to be remembered is sometimes there is cross reactivity because of the alpha chain similarity as i just mentioned with lh so hcg levels may come high uh, initially they would decrease and then they would taper and then they would re remain at less levels say 100 uh, or 50 milli interaction units uh, and they would not decrease the patient does not have any symptom that is usually because of the LH, which is stimulating and uh, which is uh, reacting with this HCG SA, and we are getting a false HCG, uh, this thing, high level. In that case, we need to uh, change and do a SA with the, another method that has to be done, and specifically beta HCG has to be done. That would eliminate all the alpha chain similarity, which is coming from the LH. Then the assays have to be done every week till we get three negative levels followed by uh, once we get three negative levels, then we can shift to monthly beta HCG. And once we get for three negative, three, uh, three negative monthly levels, then we can stop the process of HCG follow. -up. So it's just very simple. We do it weekly till it falls to normal values. Normal values are less than five milli interaction units per ml. It has to remain at the normal for three weeks. So we get three weekly negative values. And after that, we change to monthly follow-up. We get three monthly negative values and then we stop the HCG. During this time, it is important that the patient should not get pregnant and contraception is a must. Hormonal contraceptives, COCs are preferred choice. And again, we can use barrier contraceptive, we can use IUCD, but IUCD increases the chances. There's little chance of increased perforation. The safest is the hormonal method, COCs, the combined oral contraceptive pills are the best as a choice of contraception. And they have to be started after the process of evacuation only. Once you are discharging the patient, <coughs> discharge her with a COC. <coughs> Pregnancy is allowed after this follow-up. So once the beta HCG has come normal, three negative values are there. She was a simple H mole or a partial mole. She can now, uh, we can give her a go-ahead for becoming pregnant. Now this shows us the graph that how do the beta HCGs, they uh, decrease in a term pregnancy. As we see here, the term pregnancy, it is taking about two weeks from this value to come to coming back to normal beta HCG values, negative beta HCG values, as against an induced abortion where it is taking about four weeks, as against the H mole where it takes almost like 12, 12 weeks here it is mentioned. And suppose if it does not go by nine weeks, then we need to think of in terms of a persistent trophoblastic disease. So in persistent trophoblastic disease, it would start decreasing, then it would plateau and then, then it would start increasing. Here is where you need to suspect persistent trophoblastic disease. Now the current guidelines for HCG follow-up after molar pregnancy, the, there is little difference. There is little difference. Uh, the, instead of remembering what is ACOG say, NCCN say or FIGO says, uh, what I just mentioned, is a uh, follow-up which is recommended by FIGO and we would go by three consecutive normal HCG levels followed by three monthly negative levels and then the patient can be put off the, uh, the beta HCG follow-up. The prophylactic chemotherapy uh, is controversial. It is given, it will reduce the incidence of GTN in patients with high risk factors. So um, it is recommended by some in these patients. In this subset of patients only, you would like to give a prophylactic chemotherapy. Now, when the age is more than 35 years, size of the uterus, the difference between the period of amenorrhea and the size of the uterus is more than four weeks. Pre-evacuation HCG is more than one lakh international units per, L, uh, per liter or a large bilateral thecal uterine cyst is there, which is more than six centimeter. Uh, or when hormonal follow-up is unreliable or unavailable, then in these cases, we need to give prophylactic chemotherapy. And these patients, 
uh, would require chemotherapy as we will discuss, I think in the panel, uh, the injection methotrexate would be required, a single dose, um, and then beta-CG has to be followed up after that. And it has to be followed up as we do for a GTN patient. And the full course has to be given till the beta-CG comes back to normal. Now coming to how to suspect a gestational trophoblastic disease. So irregular vaginal bleeding if occurs um, after the process of evacuation or if there is fecal uterine cyst which are persisting or the uterus is subinvoluting or the, there is persistently elevated beta CG levels. They plateau or they start increasing. Then you have to suspect GTD. How do we say that the plateauing is occurring? The plateau of HCG lasts for four measurements, which are done over a three week time. So you do it day one, seven, 14, 21. You're doing it weekly. So you're getting four uh, measurements over three weeks. If the beta HCG levels are not decreasing to a, by a log 10, we expect them to decrease by log 10. Log 10 is usually 10%. So if suppose the beta HCG was 6,000, after one week when we repeat beta HCG levels, we expect it to be less than 6, 10% uh, of 6,000 would be 600. So 600 minus, uh, 6,000 minus 600 would be 5,400. And we expect it to decrease it um, by that. So uh, the beta HCG should decrease, uh, if suppose the, by 10%, it is not decreasing, it is persisting, then we have four such values occurring. Then we can say that the levels are plateauing and GTN has to be suspected. If suppose there is a rise of beta HCG and the rise is more than 10% of the basal value, this was 6,000. Now it has come, uh, it is more, the next value suppose is 8,000 and the next value further is about 10,000 or 12,000. So we are getting the rise is more than 10% and we get three values which are rising in the rising trend over a period of two weeks. Then we can easily say that this is a uh, rising uh, beta HCG level and it is going towards GTA. Or if we get histological diagnosis of choriocarcinoma, then that also the diagnosis of GTN is made. So this is just summarizing. Uh, how do we diagnose GTN following h bone rise in HCG, three values over two weeks, or plateauing of HCG, four values over three weeks, or persistence of HCG after six months also, or there is a tissue diagnosis of choriocarcinoma, or the HCG values are more than 20,000 international unit per liter after four weeks. So it's important to um, remember this and go ahead with the diagnosis and then management of GTM. Sometimes they could be twin with H bone counsel. Uh, the patient needs to be counseled regarding extra risk, excess bleeding at any stage, operative delivery, excess risk of GTN would be there. And it is important that the normalcy of the fetus is confirmed by doing a karyotyping as the, uh, there is a chance that the fetus could be having a, uh, a trisomy or a chromosomal abnormality may be there. So uh, thank you so much for your patient hearing. This was all from my side regarding the management of h -bone. Thank you so much, Dr. Subohi. It is always such a great learning experience to listen to you. And you have really covered all the important aspects, all the controversies in such a simple language, which will definitely benefit our residents, our uh, students, and also our practitioners. So thank you so much. And now I request our chairpersons, Dr. Usha Goenka, ma'am, and Dr. Neela Mishra, ma'am, to please give an expert comment and anything you want to add to this. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Subohi. I must congratulate you. You have given a wonderful talk. I think you have covered everything, right? From ultrasound, like uh, uh, in ultrasound, focal cystic spaces with the placental tissue and increase in the uh, trans diameter of the gestational sac and the high risk vesicular moon like HCG is more than 1 lakhs or excess uterine enlargement or thecal is more than 6 centimeter and one thing more patient previously on the oral contraceptive therapy they are having more chances for the high chances of the vesicular moon 
and uh, uh, around, about the uh, chromosome pattern of the uh, vesicular mole, like uh, complete mole is uh, of diploid origin, and totally from paternal origin, and the triploid is also an extra set of the paternal. So very well, I think we covered everything. Uh, I don't think any questions to be asked. We have covered very well this. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Mila, ma'am. And Dr. Usha Gunja, ma'am, would you like to Good add something? Good evening, everyone. Yeah, yeah, sure. Good evening, everybody. Dr. Subari, I should congratulate you for your very concise and crisp presentation. I want to thank my Asha Pap Kanpur for giving me this chance. I want to give you some take home messages. Number one, ultrasonic molar changes cannot be, may not be within till nine weeks of gestation. So we should be very careful in all the cases of unsuccessful pregnancies like psychic avant, missed gestation, and embryonic pregnancy, and we should go first to pathological examination of product of conception in such cases. Secondly, whenever we are doing the treatment, Dr. Subhoji rightly said that SE is the right treatment for all size of vascular mold, and we should not pass on the cannula beyond the internal nose because perforation is very common, and, and uh, NTT prophylaxis is a must in all the cases of RS negative patients. And oxytocin should be started at the beginning of sponge evacuation. And if possible, XHS should be included in uh, investigation procedures. Thank you so much. Thank you, Asapa. Thank you, Jackson Pal, the academic part. One more thing she has told about the thyroid function test. We usually omit this test. We are not getting it done because under anesthesia, she may patient may go in thyroid crisis. So we must do every patient at least TSH before Yes. Okay, Deepika, you want to say something? Ma'am, we wanted uh, one minute break here, ma'am. Okay, okay. Introducing for the first time in <laughs> India, micronized didrogesterone, Divatrol, for a safer and smoother journey to motherhood. Jugson Paul Pharmaceuticals is manufacturing all the active pharmaceutical ingredients and intermediates concerning didrogesterone making India self-reliant. Atmanirbhar Bharat. Vocal for local. Go for Divatron. Greetings to all the respected doctors. And thank you for this opportunity to connect with you all today through this webinar. We are proud to present Divatron 10 mg tablets of micronized ritrogesterone, whose API is being manufactured by Jackson Pal. The quality of our brand, Divatron 10 mg, is backed by the BioClean study, proving its clinical efficacy and safety. Moreover, with the clinical advantages, Divatron offers a safer and smoother journey to the motherhood. Our indigenous API offers a remarkable reduction in the cost to the patient, providing a more economical therapy at just ru rupees 50 per tablet. We look forward to your support to the newest brand in our product portfolio, Divatron. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Now we move ahead for our panel discussion so that we will discuss how we can apply all this knowledge to our day-to-day -day practice. And we have a lot of the queries in the chat box, so I guess with our panel, all these queries will be sorted. So to moderate this panel, I request Dr. Ranjana Khanna, ma'am, our very own. She is from Kanpur. She is currently president of ISOPA Prayagraj. She has been the vice president of Foxy and a very dynamic and very pretty. Uh, <laughs> welcome, ma'am. We will welcome you. And our co-moderator for this panel is very beautiful, very young and very dynamic. Dr. Parul Khanna, she is a communicator for ISOPAR Prayagraj. Welcome, Dr. Parul. And also we have the experts with us, with a huge knowledge. Dr. Kiran Pandey, ma'am, I think she has not joined. She will join shortly. Madam, all of us know she is the professor and head in the Department of Option Gaini at GSV Medical College Kanpur. Mm -hmm. And a prominent figure in UP and all over the India. Mm -hmm. And we have Dr. Nisha Singh. Who has immense knowledge 
in the field of oncology. She is unit head and in charge of genital cancer control unit KGMU Lucknow. We welcome you, Dr. Nisha Mehra. And we have very dynamic panelist, Dr. Pavika Lal, very hardworking and dynamic faculty of our department. Dr. Garima Gupta, very efficient and very knowledgeable faculty. She is AP in our department. Dr. Swati Gupta, the executive member of ISOPAV Kanpur. We have Dr. Kostov Srivastav. She has been faculty in our department. Now she is doing private practice. Very active member of ISOPAV. We have very intelligent Dr. Richa Bhalla. She is also the alumni of uh, our department. We have Dr. Vaishali Saktena from ISO Park Prayagraj. We welcome you, Dr. Vaishali. And we have Professor Dr. Rekha Sachan, ma'am, from the KGMU Lucknow. So I welcome all the esteemed panelists, our experts, and our moderators. At the outset, I want to thank uh, very, very warmly, my alma mater, everyone. I love you all. Dr. Meera Agniotri, ma'am. Dr. Usha Sharma, ma'am. Dr. Kiran Sinha. It is such a coincidence that you have studied in Allahabad and I in Kanpur, and I've studied in Kanpur and I'm currently in Allahabad. <laughs> so I'll just share yeah, my. I am also from Allahabad. I have MS Allahabad. Achha, okay. <laughs> Kiran, thank you. And it's lovely to see Neelam and Usha, everybody. All my dear ones are here. Okay, I think, uh, should we go ahead? Yes, yes. Sure, uh, sure, Dr. Yeah, Parul, uh, would you start? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yeah. Uh, a very good evening to all of you. So after a very well-informed and excellent talk by Dr. Sabuha Qureshi, we now will start our panel on gestational trophoblastic disease. Next slide. Just a quick review of what we have learned so far. WHO has classified gestational trophoblastic diseases in pre-malignant and malignant diseases. The pre-malignant ones include complete hydrodiform mole and partial hydrodiform mole. Malignant diseases, also known as gestational trophoblastic neoplasia, are divided into non-metastatic, which is invasive mode, placental style trophoblastic tumor, epithelioid tumor, metastatic tumors, and gestational choreocarcinoma. The gestational trophoblastic disease spectrum has recently been expanded to also include a new terminology that is atypical placental site nodule, as 10 to 15 percent of the cases may coexist with or develop into PSTT or epithelial tumors. Whereas the diagnosis of GTN does not require histological confirmation, the diagnosis of complete mole, partial mole, atypical placental site nodules does require histological confirmation. Coming to the epidemiology, gestational trophoblastic diseases are very common in Oriental countries, India being one of them. Highest incidence has been seen in Philippines with around 1 in 80 pregnancies, whereas the incidence in India is around 1 in 400 pregnancies. Calculated incidence of complete mole is around 1 in nearly 2,000 pregnancies, and for partial mole, it is 1 in 695 pregnancies. And it is also seen that the incidence of complete mole rises from 1 is to 1,000 to 1 is to 76 or 1 is to 6.5 in subsequent pregnancies. Complete mole is the most common antecedent to choriocarcinoma, but choriocarcinoma can occur after any type of pregnancy, 3% after invasive mole and 16% after complete mole. Now, if we come to the pathogenesis of the complete mole, next slide. Here we can see that the uh, for, uh, complete mole is formed after fertilization of a haploid sperm with an empty ovum followed by its duplication or sometimes it is because of the fertilization of two sperms with an empty ovum leading to complete, uh, complete mole. Hence, complete mole is always diploid in origin and androgenic with no fetal parts. Whereas partial mole, 
it is followed by diaspermic fertilization of a haploid ovum hence partial moles are always triploid in origin either 69 xxy or 69 xyy very rarely mm -hmm. and these are triploid in origin next slide the risk factors for this aberrant fertilization have not been fully understood but the common ones are extremes of reproductive age history of prior molar pregnancy only consistent environmental association has been seen between beta carotene and dietary animal fat intake oral contraceptive pills and previous abortion are risk factors for partial mole for choriocarcinoma risk factors are like prior complete mole ethnicity and advanced maternal age now we come to our first case mrs meera 18 years primary gravida she comes to the emergency room with complaints of bleeding per vaginum following an amenorrhea of 2 months on examination her bp was 120 by 80 mm mercury pulse was 100 per minute on per abdominal examination uterus was around 16 weeks in size on local examination there was minimal bleeding per vaginum on per vaginal examination os was closed and uterus measured around 18 weeks of size so uh, garima the first question yes, to you ma. is what is your differential diagnosis and how will you proceed because as you are seeing that the amenorrhea is only of 2 months but the uterus size is 18 weeks so what's your dd yes ma'am uh ma'am uh, taking account uh, into account history and examination ma'am since we have already told that the size of uh, amenorrhea and is not <clears throat> coordinating so ma'am the first cause maybe first i'll think of a physiological cause that may be to the twin pregnancy straight away we won't be going for pathological causes like the gpn and all that so <clears throat> for that ma'am uh, it may be a twin pregnancy and after doing investigation like you know uh, nowadays it's very easy for us to get a scan done so that we can get to diagnosis very early so the second most common thing that comes to my mind will be a case of gtd ma'am because size is more than the only thing it could Sorry, be a thyroid with the pregnancy yes ma'am the whole spectrum at the whole spectrum of this pregnancy cause, apart from them that uh, mistaken is definite that's why said, we will proceed with ultrasound so that it becomes easier for right. only with history and that if we can't say fibroid oh. is there yes ma'am mistaken day so always we have to ensure okay yes. so high dtd form uh, mole actually appears to be more frequent at the extremes of reproductive ages 15 to 45 the risk increases after the age of 35 and there is a 5 to 10 times increased risk after 45 we see that this patient is 18 year old so there is a two fold uh, risk in teenagers most common presentation we all know is first trimester bleeding and then the uterus could be larger so uh, diagnosis is by ultrasonography as you have rightly said so uh, yeah uh, now the uh, second question would be that on investigations ultrasound is suggesting high dtd form mole hemoglobin is 9 g lft is normal rft is normal blood group is b negative beta hcg is more than 1 lakh thyroid levels are normal now how will you manage costum yes ma'am hello yeah ha huh. Yes, ma'am. So, uh, so we have formed a diagnosis of a uh, hereditary mole, and uh, the patient is Rh negative. Clinically, she is uh, stable, no active bleeding and all. So, the uh, this has the pregnancy has to be terminated. We have to counsel the patient regarding uh, the need of further follow-ups. Uh, despite the evacuation the specimen has to be sent for histopathology and all so this first we have to counsel all these things then the evacuation has to be done by suction evacuation the preferred method is by suction evacuation and uh, a concurrent uh, oxytocin drip has to be started and uh, after the evacuation has been done the most of the molar uh, products have been taken out then we do a Uh, gentle sharp cure and if ultrasound is uh, available so uh, in in prop so that is a good thing the suction evacuation has to be done under anesthesia but we have under to be sure you know if it's a partial mole you mm -hmm. may end up with fetal parts there right then in right. that case you will have to go in for a medical abortion because that is the only case when the fetal parts are there 
right. that will deter the use of suction curettage okay right right do we arrange blood yes we should arrange there, blood also there is of course i am being negative that is going to come yeah yeah avika i wanted to ask will you prepare the cervix before suction and curettage ma'am in this case i won't like to prepare since the patient is actually has minimal bleed so might be the mice or the os might be open so we can go with serial dilatations and then we can do it with carmen scanner since it is 16 weeks uh 16 to 18 weeks size uterus 18 weeks yeah 18 weeks size uterus yes mm -hmm. and with mesoprostol there is it is it has been given there is theoretical risk of embolization although uh, recently ma'am has told that cervical ripening can be done prior to uh, suction evacuation yes. yes these are the rcog 2020 guidelines yes ma'am that you should prepare the cervix immediately prior to suction curettage right. and it's absolutely safe evidence level 2 plus ripening of the cervix with either physical dilators or yes. prostaglandins prior to the uterine products of conception removal is not associated with an increased risk of developing gtn and in a case control study of 219 patients there was no evidence that ripening of the cervix prior to uterine poc removal is linked to a higher risk of needing chemotherapy okay. so these are the rcog guidelines so you yes, can pair the cervix with prostaglandins Prostaglandin. that will make it easier because the cervix will become soft so you need less of pressure to dilate it okay yes. okay and then there is a study which was done in 2009 which says that it is best to avoid prior uh, cervical preparation oxytocic drugs and sharp curettage or medical evacuation to minimize the risk of dissemination as you were talking about but see that is old now this uh, this is a old theory 2009 now rcog 2020 says that there is no harm Yes, okay. ma'am. Even even mm -hmm. after suction evacuation, we have to do a gentle sharp curettage so that we can ensure that the uterine removal that the uh, that the procedure is complete in itself. Yeah, and yeah. better still if we could do it under ultrasound guidance. Definitely, ma'am. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Okay, Doctor Anjana, I would like to say one comment. It's ha -ha. not only Doctor Pavika as she said that to complete is the last part of the curettage, which yeah. is the uh, tissue. which comes out and that gives the actual histopathological findings and uh, any atypical changes or like true possibility yes so yeah that is most important yeah besides yeah, yeah. besides the completion this is uh, the way also it is important yeah so uh, dr ranjana if you allow me i just wanted to add something to it yeah sure sure okay so uh, we agree that uh, now the guidelines say that the use of prostaglandins is safe that's okay but yeah. what pavika said i would like to emphasize on that and i find it very correct that <laughs> our primary this thing should be by the dilatation and evacuation exactly. only only some of the cases where the os is too uh, you know tight or closed where you feel you should because why i am saying so is that whenever you give prostaglandins the chances of you know sudden opening and then torrential hemorrhage could be there in these cases when you are doing the guarded one when you it's you know in front of you you are doing it will be better so if needed then use prostaglandins otherwise if you can manage with dilation I, should be okay. yeah yeah that is actually a difference of opinion na because otherwise uh, if you uh, if the cervix is actually very tight and you are doing forceful uh, dilatation with that's dilators what? that so could be more cases, detrimental yes, so uh, i think that is what i am saying she had many more than saying there you can use it in i basically yeah. feel that is, you should insert uh, um, this mesoprostol because the and then you are there it's not that you are leaving the patient overnight with that just one mm -hmm. hour or something you know enough to soften the cervix and then you go ahead with the procedure i think that would be better so, so, that's what ma'am that is the point that yeah, if yeah, it is tightly the cervix is usually, usually very soft in these yeah, yeah, yes yes it is uh, very rarely that you find a very tight cervix. cervix yes yeah i agree 
so reserve but, it only you know, for those cases it is already open so that gives you the advantage that you just immediately you know start yes. your suction curator that, 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 so, that, yeah exactly yeah. so we reserve it only for those cases where it is really needed not yeah. make it a routine that yeah i th- i think basically kiran that it should be a you know case to case yes depending yes. on what exactly you are seeing at that time clinically absolutely yeah yes, yeah okay thank you ma'am okay so we go move go on to the next one can oxytocic infusions be used during surgical removal if so when before the procedure during the procedure at the end of the procedure if she is bleeding heavily rekha sachan yes oxytocin infusion uh, can be started uh, just beginning of the procedure and uh, before the anesthesia to start the suctioning then you can give the oxytocin infusion and it can be continued till the suction complete okay this is your view see there are very uh, a lot of different opinions in the international guidelines also rcog 2020 says that the use of oxytocic infusion prior to the completion of the mole is not recommended why because it will squeeze the myometrium and that can uh, lead to embolization excessive vaginal bleeding can be associated with surgical management of molar pregnancy there's a theoretical concern over the routine use of oxytocic agents including ergometrin and mesoprostol because of the potential to embolize and disseminate the trophoblastic tissue through the venous system so of course this occurs in normal pregnancy also now uh, in uh, 2009 the study which was done said that oxytocic agents and prostaglandin analogs are best used only after the evacuations when there is significant hemorrhage but what does figo say figo says suction evacuation and curettage ideally performed under ultrasound guidance is the preferred method of evacuation of a molar pregnancy independent of the uterine size if maintenance of fertility is desired 12 to 14 mm suction cannula we all know and iv oxytocin infusion is started at the onset of the curettage and continued for several hours post operative as rekha has just said to enhance the uterine contractility because the risk of bleeding increases with the uterine size blood for transfusion should be available when the uterus size is greater than 16 weeks judicious use of appropriate evacuation equipment and techniques access to blood products careful intra operative monitoring and early recognition and correction of complications results always in improved outcomes so uh, there are definitely two schools of thought but i feel that if the size is big and the patient is bleeding then uh, we should i feel that we should start the uh, oxytocic drip, uh, drip what is your take dr kiran this is what i was thinking actually as you rightly pointed out there are different view yeah uh, there are different views and controversies go on but from our resident period we have done this exactly. started the oxytocics and <laughs> done it now present with the present recommendations the minor variation which we have matlab uh, which i personally think i have done that is if the uterus size is not very big like 16 weeks is usually not so big that it will be without our i mean blood is obviously has to be there right so this can be managed even uh, like oxytocin be ready with the drip and everything hmm. but we can wait but if yeah. the uterus supposing the patient has come at a bigger uterus and the soft and the you naturally feel there is too much of uh, chances i mean one has to clinically also evaluate exactly in that case i would personally prefer to start the start oxytocin. an oxytocin drip so okay. i will agree with rekha when she goes ahead with the figo guidelines and uh, tells us just this that we should start it at the beginning continue it throughout the procedure and for a few hours one or two hours after the procedure also but Till if you did take it very early and not such huh. such a big sizes then you can huh. do it without oxygen then you can go without it and then in fact as rcog has said that we wait and you have completed the evacuation if the patient is not bleeding much then leave her alone you don't have to give any uterotonics but if the patient is bleeding then we must go in for oxytocin infusion so that is left to our uh, you know one size does not fit all so we can't treat 
all patients alike and it will depend on the clinical scenario once the patient presents will you give anti d in this patient she's rh negative yes yes yeah, sure ma'am we will give uh, anti d prophylaxis in this case at the time of molar evacuation yeah as, as rhd antigen is expressed on prophoblast as we have uh, just heard from dr sabhoi but uh, you know uh, they are saying now that if you have diagnosed that it is a partial mole then it need not be given but because it takes more than 72 hours to diagnose whether it was a partial or a complete mole because what happens that in partial molar pregnancies fetal tissues uh, may include red cells so it is safer to give anti d prophylaxis safer yeah international illness uh veshali will you send the products of conception for histopathological examination in all the cases of miscarriages well uh yes uh, i would uh, like to send all the cases which i do dnc's for uh, to exclude the uh, polio uh, and uh, gtds but uh, okay. it is when it is not possible when we give uh, medical exactly. abortions then uh, we will go for uh, hcgs after 4 weeks a follow up hcg would be a better thing to uh, follow up for gtds yeah and uh, actually there is no need for a histological examination following therapeutic abortion provided that the fetal parts have been identified at the time of surgical abortion but of course uh, if you haven't sent the tissue then you do a pregnancy test after 3 weeks so that will confirm yes, If What pregnancy is parts are not uh, fetal parts are not there in the uh, yeah. ultrasound, we don't yeah. identify. Then we should uh, send yes. the product. Yes, ideally, yes, that is the correct answer. Doctor Nisha, your take on this? Yeah, absolutely. I think this is one important message to go that whenever you have an abortion, yes, and it is not an obvious fetal parts are not seen. It must be sent, particularly so in. missed abortion cases right. and because you know so many times so many patients come the evacuation was done neither do we have a pre abortion ultrasound nor do we have the histopath we True. have nothing we don't <laughs> even know what kind of pregnancy it was so yeah. obviously if you are doing by surgical method uh, and you don't see uh, fetal parts you must send it uh in medical method of obviously patient will expel anywhere any time and then you will not have but then as you said follow up uh, with the yeah. bsp after 3 weeks so that makes sense yeah yeah, yeah. uh dr swati would you advise prophylactic chemotherapy post suction curettage in all the cases of gtd Ma'am, currently it is controversial because almost ninety-eight percent of the of the partial mole and eighty-five percent of the complete moles are uh, cured itself by the suction and curettage. But in case when there is higher risk, that like uh, uterine size is greater than one month of the uh, uh, more than one month of the uh, expected size, then if it is uh, uh, it is a complete mole. Or beta HCG level is greater than one lakh, or the thecal uterine cyst is greater than six centimeters, or if there are more than one medical complications like hyperthyroidism, preeclampsia, etc. So then we can give uh, prophylactic chemotherapy in these cases. Or if the age of the mother is older than forty years, because uh, pro, uh, chemotherapy itself has its own problems. has its own risks so even the oncologists do not recommend chemotherapy before the evacuation of the mole ma'am this is a very important point mm -hmm. and uh, uh, you know in different uh, webinars we have debates on this issue so mm -hmm. i would not like it to go just like that uh, sure because prophylactic you know when we talk uh our prime i mean this question has come a little too early i would say because mm -hmm. we have to first emphasize on the method of follow up and then treatment this is just a small uh, component of the whole yeah, reacting to that actually yeah we should not be uh, conveying these messages so much that this is you know one method of treatment no why one thing is how many percentage of them will develop gtn we know with complete mole 20% 5% with partial mole and whatever we have mm. and then it is the follow up that is important so if they develop then we 
side effects of the chemotherapy will be there then the chemotherapy it's not one injection you have to give a full course so as it is you will have to monitor and do everything so i think on any broad yeah. platform giving a message about this we no but uh, dr nisha i think you know what that uh, when we talk about she has already told the risk factors so high right. mole even the high risk mole we yeah. would like to go in for prophylactic chemotherapy so dr khanna it is not like the standard that if you have high risk factors you give prophylactic it's not yeah. like that it's yeah. not like you may give it in those cases where you have so it's it's a second uh, it's an alternate It's I think we can do it in consultation with the gynecological uh, oncologist. Absolutely, you know? because yeah. we have been managing so many cases, and uh, right. because you know, it just gives a message that anybody and everybody can give chemotherapy, and no. they start on to that earlier than actually learning the actual follow up, and then picking up who needs it, who doesn't, which is more important. That's true uh, i think i would also dr ranjana i would like to give the opinion in this uh, dr nisha has very rightly said ki we have to emphasize on follow ups and monitoring more like, but we are this that but at the same time dr nisha i would not say ki we just have to be very stuck about it because once in a while our patients and that's are okay. such that's huh? okay that's so okay then, i mean we have to understand we have to make them the message has to be given of course more important is follow up so more is important is different. monitoring and but then just a word about this also yeah. many a times are uh, your you know that your patient मतलब लाइक मे बी यू डोंट हैव एनी प्रैक्टिस वी हैव हैड इन गवर्नमेंट हॉस्पिटल्स मेनी टाइम्स वी नो दे डू नॉट कम एट ऑल फॉर अ वेरी वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट थिंग्स आल्सो लाइक आप आपने यू हैव डन अ ओवेरियन सर्जरी फॉर अ ओवेरियन कैंसर एंड देन यू हैव एक्सप्लेन देम टू गो फॉर अ कीमोथेरेपी यू गिव देम इन राइटिंग इन हिंदी यू गिव देम इन राइटिंग एंड एवरीथिंग टेक कंसेंट and still they go and sit at the home ma'am so we, we have all the type of patient so exactly. we should just discuss all options exactly. and so then so my the, point was and then that, and then we have to be very careful about the hcg levels yeah. so it is a, if they are very high then obviously and if there no fetal products i mean no products of conception inside obviously this is going in favor towards gtn so uh, i think i would go in for consultation with the oncologist and then if they advise then we can go ahead with the you know prophylactic chemotherapy depending on everything all factors should be taken only exactly. then fin finally you can think of it so ma'am that as such not yeah, as that's such. what so the primary management will has definitely we follow up in the monitoring yes. there is no so there exactly. is no substitute no hmm. substitute for that exactly yes. so garima what is the optimum follow up following a diagnosis of gtd yes ma'am ma'am according to rcog uh, hmm. if it's a case of complete molar pregnancy so and if the hcg is reverted to normal within you know uh, 56 days of pregnancy that is around 8 right. weeks then hmm. follow up will be for 6 months from the date of uterine removal ma'am but if the hcg is not reverted to normal within 56 days of pregnancy even then follow up will be 6 months from normalization of the hcg level This is the difference, and for partial mole, ma'am, it uh, the RCG has said that it, once the HCG has returned to normal on two samples that are you know four weeks apart, then we have to stop the uh, follow up. Right. And ma'am, for women who have not received any chemotherapy, that the question last question was there. We no longer uh, if they have not received the chemotherapy, ma'am. So they do they uh, no longer need to have HCG measured after the subsequent pregnancy event, ma'am, because if 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 they had received uh, basically chemotherapy, then for the next subsequent pregnancy, they would have to have HCG done. Follow up should be done for them, but not if uh, but it's not necessary if no chemotherapy has been received. But practically, ma'am, what happens? Most of us do that. Uh, you know, after second pregnancy, we do a HCG or a UPT after uh, four to eight weeks. Practically, ma'am. Mm -hmm. So actually, the Journal of Obs and Gynae and Cancer Research says that uh, 2018 study. that after the evacuation of molar pregnancy the patient is followed up with hcg titer after 48 hours and make that the baseline and do weekly titers yeah. thereafter yes. the titer yes. should reach undetectable levels that is less than 5 and persist for 2 weeks the mean time for normalization of the hcg titer in a complete mole is 9 months partial mole 7 9 uh, weeks sorry and in partial mole 7 weeks 
once beta hcg is undetectable this is confirmed with monthly determinations for another 6 months after this surveillance is discontinued and pregnancy can be allowed the hcg titer in 2 weeks after termination of molar pregnancy is very important for detecting persistent gtn in recent research so uh satisfied uh, experts or should i move forward please go ahead ma'am okay uh parul take the second case mrs parul. meera uh portion obstetric history of abortion one has no living issue at 19 years of age i think she is the same girl na mrs meera yes mrs meera was there na she Who comes after that? one year with an abortion now she comes to you 6 months after suction evacuation done for molar pregnancy and is now in fetal condition her histopathology report for previous was suggestive of complete hydatiform mode now cause to what will you advise to her yes ma'am what is your advice yeah this thing we have just been discussing uh, sabhi ma'am has also yeah. discussed and we were discussing the follow up so uh, basically we have to look uh, for her reports uh what yeah. has she been under a proper uh, beta hcg follow up or not so uh, the criteria as we discussed that first we have to understand uh, the time that when weekly beta hcgs have to be done and once the beta hcg levels normalize after that uh, minimum of 3 months and at least 6 months have to be followed up followed up monthly so now she has come to us 6 months after suction cure retouch so first we have to determine more uh, i think we should ask her to uh, get a further follow up because uh, approximately 8 weeks are going to take for the beta hcg levels to normalize and then we have to follow her up further for next 6 months so at least two more months she is advised contraceptive right so uh, now will you would you like to terminate the pregnancy uh, is it indicated if accidental pregnancy occurs no ma'am accident no ma'am but i would say no. okay no ma'am this is not okay. indicated ha huh? yeah no, that's what figo says so uh, parul mrs meera understands that she should not conceive since her follow up period is not yet complete she asks you for an appropriate contraceptive what okay. contraceptive would you advise pavika so the, yes ma'am so the best contraception will be low dose combined oral contraceptive pills she should Still, be advised uh, not until the hcg beta hcg levels are normal till yeah, that yeah, ma'am definitely would prefer definitely the con- barrier methods yeah yeah till till the beta hcg normalizes we have to use barrier contraceptives and right. once the beta hcg normalizes we can use combined oral contraceptives but ma'am recently i have uh, got a an article where they have said that they can we can use low dose oral contraceptive but how Okay. There is an article in a, a United Kingdom medical eligibility criteria where they're saying that we can use combined oral contraceptives even if the beta hcg has been normalized. But we have studied that we have to use barrier contraception until beta hcg normalizes, and once the beta hcg normalizes, we can give low dose OCPs, and even IUCDs can be given once the beta hcg normalizes. What do you say, Doctor Kiran? what would uh, you say she basically do uh, you know uh, barrier methods have a very high failure rate though yes I ma'am mean, that is my uh, that, that, that is, is my the theory. drawback so maybe yeah. low dose pills would not be bad because that is yeah, the, the what we want the, the newer that research is, is saying ki low exactly dose ma'am was, because yeah. uh, the once the initial stages we were not having so low dose contraceptive oral pills now <laughs> we have very uh, even ultra very low dose pills ha, are there ha, ha. so if i mean no risk factor is there you, you can also see that if there is no high risk factor mm. then you can use a low dose oral pills because the chances of failure rate and the con- other confusions are very rare with the barrier contraceptives na, in fact you have to use double method only then you can be it can be reliable so and that or that also depends on many many factors the failure you all know that so it's always good to use uh, 
better safer method unless and until there are high risk factors so actually ma'am what was uh, the uh, problem was only exogenous estrogens high dose uh, you know you are giving it was not it was yeah that's why it was there so it's not about the contraceptive doses to less so in low dose it is the fertility um, uh, drugs or the exogenous estrogen that actually uh, will not be recommended during that time but uh, low dose contraceptives can be given definitely better uh, this thing um, safer yeah safer and more effective more yeah effective. yeah Yes, ma'am. Even United Kingdom uh, medical eligibility criteria says that we can give combined low dose oral contraceptives. Yeah. Even they have also told that we can give POPs and implants and DMPs. But I think DMP will not be a suitable alternative because it can give rise to irregular bleeding and can be again mistaken exactly. during the follow up. Then, so low dose OCPs uh, is a better suitable alternative. There will be confusion the as to why the patient yes, is bleeding. Yes, ma'am. Uh, yeah. Very, very recently, the progesterone pill, those 24 plus four drops <laughs> have come. So right. they, they are with them, the chances of this BTB uh, as with the DIMPA is not there. So they can yeah. also be one of the options. But of course, the more studies are required. At yeah, moment, we are recommending uh, that for breastfeeding, lactating yeah, women. Yeah, no? yeah, yeah. And they are actually the like the uh, traditional POPs where the BTB period was only one or two, I think two hours or four hours. It yeah. was there, but in these drops, Perinon uh, twenty four plus four pills, the uh, that period that period has become twenty four hours. So they right. have become safer. Yeah, yeah, we can use those. Yes. And that would be better because at least safer because barrier methods are very unpredictable. Very unpredictable. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, although uh, host is, uh, you know, accidentally muting me every time. So please, Deepika, see to it that I'm not muted. So uh, case three, Parul. Yes, ma'am. Mrs. Geeta, 32 years female. Para 2, Life 2, Abortion 1, comes to emergency room with irregular persistent vaginal bleeding since last six weeks. On examination, patient gives history of suction curettage done for complete hydratiform mole six weeks back. Patient was discharged after three days of the procedure and seven days after the discharge, she started having irregular persistent bleeding continued till day. Initially, there was soakage of one to two pads per day, but since yesterday, bleeding she was bleeding heavily with soakage of three to four pads. Next slide. Ali Badni Rayage. Kya hoga? Some problem. Why isn't moving forward? Slide. Uh -huh. It's moving, ma'am. Uh -huh. So, Rekha is repeat surgical removal indicated in vesicular mole and in which condition? Actually, uh, I think we go for the complete examination. History and exa physical examination as well as ultrasound, transvaginal sonography and B serum beta SCG level. Mm -hmm. Along with that, if there is doubt about that, then we go for the uh, liver function test, kidney function and thyroid function test. Based minimum that test required. Sometimes WBC count is also required. After the confirmation, this is a mole. Then repeat as the suction is not required if we are sure this is the rise in beta scg that means this is a persistent mole persistent gtn if it is a persistent gtn then we can uh, do the scoring or we grade the disease and we go directly for the uh, chemotherapy sometimes if uh, we think if bleeding is more then we can do the suction and we send the tissue for histopathology otherwise we don't uh, do the suction evacuation. We directly go for the chemotherapy. What if the patient is bleeding heavily and she comes to you hemodynamically unstable and the HCG levels which are done immediately are less than 1500? What would you do? Would you try to do a repeat surgical evacuation? Patient is getting ensanguinated because she's bleeding a lot. If patient what? is uh, bleeding, then bleeding... You can't uh, start with chemotherapy then, na? No, no. Then we uh, do the uh, first stabilize the patient. First priority, do the ABC. Means uh, airway, breathing, circulation is very important. And then we arrange for the blood. 
in along with that we do the suction evacuation otherwise patient may collapse because of bleeding patient is already bleeding so heavily she can collapse at any time yeah then suction is Even required along first. with the management by if on ultrasound you see that there is some retained pregnancy tissue she is bleeding profusely then it's always safer to do a repeat yeah. evacuation yeah yeah definitely dr kiran it's okay and if some uh, already the histopathology has been not sent to at least send ha this now we will use immediately pause. send the histopathology also definitely after the repeat evacuation definitely what are the investigations dr richa that you would like to do ma'am since mrs geeta has presented in emergency with heavy bleeding pb and we mm -hmm. have made a clinical diagnosis of persistent gestational trophoblastic neoplasia in our mind the investigations will be based not only on the uh, for the diagnosis but also to assess if there is any presence or extent of metastasis if any and um, first of all we would like to go for uh, beta scg levels and since the patient was bleeding and uh, after stabilizing the vitals we, we would uh, go for a complete blood picture blood group liver function test kidney function test blood sugar thyroid profile a coagulation profile serum electrolytes and obviously whole abdomen and pelvic ultrasound as rightly said then uh, we should also go for a chest x ray and uh, if there are signs of okay, you are muted which you unmute yourself ha huh. ma'am it was muted whole time नहीं 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 आप अभी वी वर हियरिंग टिल नाउ ओके देन वी वुड लाइक टू गो फॉर सीटी ऑफ ब्रेन चेस्ट एंड एब्डोमेन फॉर द एक्सटेंट ऑफ मेटास्टेसिस आई थिंक यू नो व्हाट इज मोस्ट इंपॉर्टेंट इज अ टीवीएस यस टीवीएस टीवीएस इज मोस्ट इंपॉर्टेंट आल्सो हां बट टीवीएस टीवीएस विल टेल यू बैंग ऑन व्हाट द प्रॉब्लम इज एंड इन दिस केस you uh, done a beta hcg and then you repeat it after two days there is a rising trend and mm -hmm. tvs shows a heterogeneous mass 4 cm in the myometrium fundal region of the uterus now color doppler prominent blood flow signals within the lesion so it suggests new vascularization and pulmonary metastasis yes it was there so what is your diagnosis now see this so it is going for an invasive mole right So, what is your diagnosis, uh, Vaishali? Obviously, it is a gestational trophoblastic neoplasia, uh, like we have seen that it is invasive. It, uh, the beta HCGs are rising, and she is bleeding oh, profusely. Ma'am, so ma I would like to interpret, interfere here a little bit. Yeah. You know, just, just this uh, statement of saying rising uh, tighter when doing after two days, uh, you know, like. it's okay the other features are suggestive because patient has come with bleeding it was a case of molar pregnancy and it is post evacuation she is bleeding there is a mass and the chest x ray also they are all in there is neo vascularization also blood vessels yeah. also there right so but then the only point that the beta hcg which was done on the day 1 whenever she came it was 5000 yeah. and then after two days somebody repeats and says it is rising is not a very right this thing because rising titer the term is used when we do it weekly when we have it after two days it's like you know reconfirming if you we sometimes send it from one then we say let's repeat if we really want to see the rise because we feel that this value is not enough but in this do it we show there's pulmonary metastasis also so ma'am yeah. only point yeah. was my yeah. point other was other pieces are there No, no, yeah. everything is fine. It's just that using the term "rising tighter" okay. for okay. after two days is not correct. Okay, that's all. Yeah. Okay, fine. Rest, everything is fine, and in, we can ask the stage. In fact, what is the stage of the disease? Yeah, of course, we'll have to do the staging for that. What yeah, the that will come later. Yeah, because you got the chest already there. Yeah. How will you define GT and Doctor Swati? Swati, how are you? Is, yes, ma'am. Huh. If there is any evidence of persistence of GTD after the primary treatment, uh, most commonly recognized by the persistent elevation of beta HCG, then it is condition is called as GT, uh, GTN, and uh, 
diagnosis does not require a histopathological confirmation. Actually, this has been very beautifully told by Dr. Subuhi. Uh, at the FIGO Gynecology Oncology Committee meeting in 2000, the definition of postmolar GTN based on HCG level changes, histology, and specific investigations was agreed. And the criteria for diagnosis of GTN was when the plateau of HCG lasts for four measurements over a period of three weeks or longer, that is day one, seven, 14, and 21. When there is a rise in HCG for three consecutive weekly measurements over at least a period of two weeks or more, one, seven, and 14, and if there is a histological diagnosis of choriocarcinoma, these as the, uh, this is the criteria for diagnosing a GTN. Agreed? Yeah, this is what I was saying. <laughs> yes. yes. Definitely, that is the correct. Yeah. How will you investigate for GTN, Garima? Dr. Garima. Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, am I audible? Yeah, yeah, you are. Yeah, yes, ma'am. Ma'am, as with SCG, we have already made the diagnosis. So now the emphasis, uh, emphasis should be made on, you know, assessment staging of the GTN. So that for that one, we have to do proper history and physical examination. And as you said, Dr. Pelvic ultrasound comes in handy, to, you know, to, uh, to exclude the pregnancy or you, uh, to size, assess the, delineate the volume of the tumor, vasculature of the tumor and the spread to the pelvic metas, uh, pelvic areas also. Apart from that, and we have to rule out the metastasis. So that is most commonly it goes to, you know, uh, the chest, chest and the brain. For that, ma'am, I, I we can, uh, initially we can do a chest x-ray uh, with uh, ma'am, uh, CT head or MRI, uh, MRI brain, or rather, if there's some confusion, we can even go for CT chest also. Apart right. from that, we have to follow RFT and TFT. I mean, obviously, the routine CDC and the uh, the, the platelet counts and all that. The, right. the emphasis, the emphasis should be on the to uh, to rule out the metastasis. Man, even the physical examination is very important because what happens sometimes vaginal metastasis is there that we that we can miss out with only uh, you know investigation. So we have to look at we have to do a PS examination also. Yes. True, true. And from the after staging, yes, ma'am. After staging, um, we have to do accordingly. We'll manage the patient. I'm frankly speaking, uh, 5,000 and 7,000 values do not uh, actually correlate well with the yes, other findings Definitely. in this huh. case. So if yes, the other findings yes, actually were not there, I would have waited and repeated yes, it after a week and then put it into the criteria and then only level. Actually, one, seven, yeah, yes. 14. Yeah, we yes, should have waited. Yes. Yeah. So how will you manage GTN, Vaishali? Uh, the management of GTN is uh, generally by chemotherapy and it will depend on the stage and um, the classification. So we have right. to uh, define the stage properly. And uh, like the uh, FIGO staging is done as one, two, three, and four. And uh, one is that of gestational trophoblastic tumors confined to the corpus. Two is uh, extending to the adnexa, adnexa or to the vagina, but limited to genital structures. And three is that extending to the lungs. And here it has extended to the lungs. So it will be stage three. And uh, four is other metastatic sites. So we have seen that it has extended to the lungs. So it's stage three. And then we'll give a scoring. That, that is according to the WHO FIGO score. And uh, that will be it is a low risk if it is less than six risk so and if it is more than six then it will be considered a high risk and uh, according to that uh, according to the age and uh, less than 40 more than 40 zero one and uh, there's a whole staging and uh, according to that we will stage if you want i'll tell the whole thing no no. no 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 it's fine uh, okay so, See, basically, uh, yeah, basically, it's this uh, which yeah. is important. This uh, slide, yeah. yeah. So risk, high risk, and then we will uh, give either a single agent or regimen for low risk. And uh, the single agent is usually methotrexate and folinic acid eight day regimen. We give right, right. We give fifty mg methotrexate intramuscularly on day one, three, five, and seven. Yeah, and with folinic acid fifteen mg. 24 hours, hours after methotrexate, that is day 2, 4, 6, 8, like yeah. that. 
or we can give methotrexate 0.4 mg per kg max to max 25 mg iv uh, for continuously for 5 days and repeat after uh, 2 weeks every 2 weeks or but we can give actinomycin there, d but if there is liver uh, intolerance then actinomycin d can be relied on yeah and uh, there also we can give either in the pulse form 1.25 mg per meter square intravenously every 2 weeks or 0.5 mg IV for 5 days uh, every 2 weeks. And there are other regimens also like methotrexate 30 to 50 mg per meter square intramuscularly weekly or as an infusion, methotrexate 300 mg yeah. per meter square. Uh, like that we can do for this uh, low risk DTN. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, then we have to follow up with beta HCG. And when it doesn't respond to one therapy, one single therapy, which is resistant and the beta HCG plateaus, then we have to switch over to actinomycin. Um, and uh, there are other modalities also like avilumab is also given as a second line treatment uh, for methotrexate failed patients. And um, But actinomycin D is considered to be... Uh, much better for salvaging treatment in low risk PTN. Uh, yeah, but in low risk, so, uh, high risk. We, yeah, and in this, uh, or, uh, as she has completed her family, uh, hysterectomy can also be an alternative for this patient uh, if she opts for it. Uh, but then after that, also, we have to give post operative chemotherapy and, and follow up. Um, yeah. And follow up for that. Hmm. Lifelong. And back, yeah, That's life a very important message that yeah. even for post hysterectomy also that doesn't mean that GTN possibility will be totally ruled out. Exactly. So the follow up is very important even in these cases. HCG, yeah, uh, it has to be done lifelong. So yeah, uh, 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 even after HCG has returned to normal, then consolidation is given with two or three more said. cycles. Uh, of chemotherapy has to be given to reduce the chance of recurrence. And uh, this was for low-risk GTN. And uh, in high-risk GTN, we give a multi-dose regime, which is EMA-CO, uh, that is etoposide, methotrexate, actinomycin D, cyclophosphamide, and vincristine chemotherapy we give for uh, high-risk GTN. It will be depending on the oncologist for this, no? So, ma'am, I yes, think, yes, of course. Yeah. We'll Dr. Refer. Tisha, what would you say for this? Ma'am, it's very important here because, you know, once you label a patient yeah. as GTN, yeah. one, you have to know the correct criteria. And once you label or you suspect, it's better that the patient is taken care of by a gynec oncologist. Exactly. Or a person who has That's been important. managing these cases or a place where they have been. I mean, because, you know, uh, there will be a lot of things like actinomycin D in theory you will read is better than this. But if you see all over the Asian countries, people who have been like, if you ask me, I have this more than 20 years experience of using methotrexate regime only. So yeah. we, we have not used uh, actinomycin D as the primary and most of the Asian uh, countries, they do not use. So yeah. there are lots of things, the monitoring that is required. So this is my only message that yes, we should all know about this, but the management after uh, labeling it as GTN should be in the part by an oncologist, by the expert hands. No, it could be one of the gynecologists who has had the experience or a yes. center where it is being done properly. So True. that's important. So that referral and registration of uh, you know uh, these malignancies is very important. Otherwise, of yes, course, we know all this. What uh, what she has told is correct, and. Um, that's it. I wanted to say that. Rekha, what's the role of hysterectomy? Especially uh, if a patient is not desirous for the family, we can do hysterectomy. But hysterectomy is not the answer. We can manage by the chemotherapy. If it is resistant tumor or something, sometimes it is locally invasive, then we can do the hysterectomy. If bleeding is uncontrolled, then we can do hysterectomy. Actually, chemotherapy is the priority. In the placental side, trophoblastic tumor and the epithelioid trophoblastic yeah. tumor, they yeah. don't spread much. And so it is better to do in toto hysterectomy. But yeah. then we have to continue follow-up. Yeah. That is very important. And That's preserve so her ovaries. Yeah. 
yeah. ovaries have to be preserved. So, ma'am, here again, these are the newer variants of GTD that have come up. PSPT is relatively old, but still the, it is quite rare. Yeah. Epithelioid tumor also. By and large, most of the cases will be either vesicular, uh, uh, these... Uh, Invasive mole or choriocarcinoma. Yeah. So most of them will need chemotherapy as the primary modality. It could be an adjuvant. So it will be very few cases where surgery will become the primary modality of treatment. True, Otherwise, true. it will just, just be an additional thing. You tend to do it, but as yeah. the president said, the monitoring and follow up, everything will be as you do in, uh, you know, without hysterectomy also. True. So, so here I to add to one thing. In uh, PSTT, only hysterectomy is not advisable. Hysterectomy along with pelvic lymphadenectomy is also must charge. in PSTT tumors. Uh, because they do uh, by, by exactly. Yeah, so in PSTT, uh, <laughs> hysterectomy plus pelvic lymphadenectomy is the modality of treatment, yeah. surgical treatment basically. But I make yeah. around one percent of the cases basically. Yeah, ma'am, so it's so rare. So right? You have to know that. Yeah, it's yeah. very. And you have to keep in mind, but not that the, they are the most common. The rare ones. Uh, Richa, how will you follow up a case of GTN? Uh, follow up all, in all cases, even after hysterectomy is mandatory. Uh, it is done weekly until the beta CT levels are negative for three consecutive weeks. Then two weeks, every two weeks for three months. Then every month for one year thereafter. And every six to 12 months for at least... Uh, three to five years or even lifelong i would prefer lifelong in this case yeah and um, uh, if, if if after follow-ups it was found uh, that it is found that there is no adverse effect on subsequent pregnancies provided conception occurs uh, one year after the completion of the chemotherapy right one more important thing is that uh, we for the prevention of recurrent disease additional two cycles of chemotherapy should be given after the normalization of the hcg levels and that is what figo recommends right yes. and um, there is increased risk of development of secondary malignant uh, lesions like leukemia colon cancer breast cancer if it has been treated with multi agent chemotherapy this is what i have read yesterday only Okay. Uh, and effective contraception, a reliable contraception is must during the follow-up period. That we have all decided. Yes. With the uh, contraceptive pills only. Yes, only contraceptive pills. But this is one good thing about GTN. This is the only neoplasia where even the fertility is, I mean, almost 100% reachable. Uh, so that's one point. good point about this. And uh, yeah. though obviously, as Richa, you said, ki lifelong will be warranted, but nobody will, does it and neither the patient comes to yes. this. We have to be more strict in those earlier periods. That is right. the, there and we have to why, convince. Yeah, ma'am, that's why that registration concept of registry of all malignancy cases, and then they keep coming, you know, like we have our follow-ups very long. True, because true. Know that this is the place that they have to visit, you know, because they, they have to understand that now they're a case of a malignancy. So yes. then it just, yeah. Therefore, they're recommending that certain centers should, should be set up for this. Yes, need. that is what registry involves. Yeah. <laughs> So, Parul, the fourth case. Case, case four, 40-year-old patient, female, was diagnosed with low-risk GTD. She received single-agent methotrexate. Her HSG, HCG was 80. Patient was followed after one week and her HS, HCG was 75. And after two weeks, HCG was 78 million international units per ml. What could it be? Costum. Costum. Dr. Kostu. Pardon? Oh. Huh. Yes. Oh, sorry. I thought um, I did not mute, unmute myself. Okay. I'm so sorry. So in this case, this is a diagnosed case of low risk GTD. The patient has received a single agent methotrexate. And uh, post that, when we are uh, seeing the SCG values, they are, uh, they are very low, but they are uh, approximately the same, uh, within the same range uh, weekly. So two things come to my mind uh, as of now. Uh, one thing, this first we have to differentiate this with a persistent disease uh, and uh, this might be a case of uh, quiescent uh, GTN. Quiescent GTN is a case in which uh, we, uh, receive, we see that we have 
uh, HCG values which are very low. That is uh, less than 500 uh, international units per ml. But they uh, they are found uh, uh, if we are progressively following them up to three up to three months we may see the same values. This is and uh, in this case we'll have to rule out whether there is any active lesion, any active disease. If the yes. patient is asymptomatic and the levels are uh, continuously in this very uh, low normal range. So this might be a case of quiescent GPL. But we also have to consider the phenomena of uh, quiescent of the phantom antibodies. Because right. uh, there is a, a case of phantom HCG in which there is uh, a certain proportion of women in the reproductive age groups have very low levels of uh, beta HCG positive. So on serum evaluation, we find beta HCG is positive, but when we do a urine examination, it comes out to be negative. So uh, this is because LH and FSH levels are high. So in perimenopausal women or postmenopausal women, we also may find this. So first we have to differentiate it with phantom beta, it's phantom HCG. Otherwise, uh, unnecessary chemotherapy may be given. Yeah. So UPT has to be done. Hmm. See, uh, ideally an HCG assay that can detect all forms of HCG, including beta HCG. I think uh, Dr. Subuhi also mentioned it. Core HCG, C terminal HCG, nicked uh, free beta, beta core, and preferably the hyperglycosylated forms should be used. To exclude a false positive result, retest with another assay kit that uses serial dilutions or a test for urine HCG may be used. However, a persistent low HCG level needs continuous monitoring, as you have just said, as some may progress to GTN with rising HCG levels. Case five, Parul. So, ma'am, just to add, this is the that, last case. Yeah, it, all these uh, types of beta uh, of HCG will not be available in most of the labs. Yeah, and we exactly. We will have only beta HCG actually. Right, so right. Yeah, that's also important. So, uh, you just have to follow with those values and keep those True. in mind. True. Yeah, ma'am. May I may I add one thing? Yeah. Uh, phantom SCGs can also be suppressed with the use of low dose OCPs. So whenever we have confusion, we can use low dose OCPs in such a patient and then follow with serial beta SCG measurements. Because phantom SCGs can be suppressed with low dose OCPs if we give the patient low dose OCPs. Okay. So the last case. Moving on to case five. Mrs. Manorama, 37 years, primary gravida comes to the OPD for, with four months of amenorrhea and ultrasound suggestive of diamorphic monochorionic live twin gestation with one normal fetus alongside a molar pregnancy at 18 weeks of gestation. The patient has conceived following intrauterine insemination and she is now worried regarding the report as to whether continue the pregnancy or not. How would you proceed? Swati. Ma'am, first of all, we will do the counseling of the patient. Now, since it is a diamniotic monochorionic twin pregnancy, as we, as we can see, so it is arising from a single zygote. So, uh, because the placenta is only one. So, that is what uh, I was also confused when I read this question. So, uh, the, because it is sim, uh, single origin, so it may be a partial molar pregnancy, which is confused to be a viable pregnancy, according to me. Because uh, they, therefore, the karyotyping is very important in this case. Photosynthesis and amniocentesis should be done. And thereby, the karyotyping should be determined. And also, P57 assay can be done whether to determine whether it is an androgenic origin uh, complete mode or if it is preferred, then definitely it is a partial mode. And then if the karyotyping is normal, then we should convey the patient about the risk uh, uh, which are involved in continuation of the twin pregnancy that there are earlier risk of intrauterine fetal loss, premature birth, preeclampsia. Also, there are only 25% chances to have a live birth. So all these medical complications and also the risk of hemorrhage, etc., should be explained to the patient. Preeclampsia also. Yes. Yeah. But you know, she could be desperate because she has uh, had it by her IVF. So although there is a high risk of spontaneous abortion, about 40% to 60% result in live births. In conti if continuation of pregnancy is desired, fetal karyotype, very rightly said, should be obtained. Chest radiography needs to be performed to screen for metastasis and serial serum HCG levels must be followed. If the fetal karyotype is normal, major fetal malformations are excluded 
by ultrasonography and there is no evidence of metastatic disease, it is reasonable to allow the pregnancy to continue unless pregnancy-related complications force us to deliver the patient. After delivery, the placenta should be histologically evaluated and the patient should be followed closely with serial HCG values as one would with a singleton high deity deform mole. We have no, had but, one case, ma'am. We have had one similar hmm. case. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Uh, Rekha, but a the patient size to terminate. This is a diamniotic monochorionic pregnancy. So the uh, we have to be counsel the patient. You the know, uh, doc Dr. Kiran, when I was doing my post-graduation, that time there was no ultrasound. So uh, once we, when we were doing a Caesar, we realized that part of it was molar and otherwise the baby was absolutely normal. So those days, you know, I, yeah, it was agreed, not... agreed, agreed, agreed. <laughs> this happens in so many miracles yeah. have happened. Now we are but with, uh, no actually problem, prepared, but no no those days we were not prepared. The problems are more with the, I mean, the chances of... Uh, yeah. Abortion and other miscarriages and IUD. Right. Definitely. More with the second fetus. Though that and preeclampsia, I have seen often associated with the uh, molars. So, uh, patient has, decides to. has to be counseled and, for, and has to be prepared for every. every right. Possibility. So, patient decides to terminate the pregnancy. What method would you opt for, Rekha? Patient decide to terminate the pregnancy in this pregnancy is near about 18 weeks of gestation. Mm. So we need the priming and the suction evacuation. But priming is required in this case because are you are fetal baby. parts and fetal parts are there. Yeah. Fetal parts are there, no? As is delivery, just like we, uh, the, you can do a medical evacuation. Medical termination. Just medical like termination, karo. termination. Yeah. Yeah. You will have to. You don't have any other option. Yeah. Can we parts are there. Uh, we have said already that one part was normal. Na? Uh, normal yeah, pregnancy. One is normal. That's yeah. Can we use misoprost in this case for priming? Yeah. yeah. Can we use misoprost in this case for priming? So it is not priming. It is for expulsion. Expulsion. Yes, for expulsion. It will be a medical method water. that you will have to use for... Yeah, for twin pregnancies where there is a non-molar pregnancy alongside a molar pregnancy and the size of the fetal parts deters the use of suction curettage. This is RCOG 2020. Medical removal can be used. They also say that medical removal of a complete molar pregnancy should be avoided if possible, irrespective of the agents that we talked about. In a review of 4 to 4, 7 women with GTD, the risk of developing GTN and requiring chemotherapy was 16-fold higher when medical methods of removal were used compared with the surgical removal. But when the fetal parts are there, you will have to do medical removal. Ma'am, but can we go directly for hysterotomy in this case? Because since mm. it is already twin pregnancy, PA, may, matlab, there will be excessive IVF she has conceived. She may want to try again, na? After oh, the first will be better. Another, yeah. another thing is, uh, Pavika, when you yes, try to evacuate too. them uh, through the open method abdominally, you know, the molar part will need a suction later on. Yes. So, yes, like expulsion of the fetus and then a suction still may be needed later on. Okay, ma'am, but I have studied case will... reports. They have, uh, they have, I don't know and why they, cases, don't, they are... don't went, went for medical abortion. So, they directly went for hysterotomy. I don't know why. That's why I asked. So, this. Uh, see, I mean, uh, they, these are rare they cases. Support. Obviously, people report. Yes, ma'am. Definitely. Uh, whatever they have done. But as we understand, if it is a molar uh, tissue, which is one of the fetuses is completely evacuation will not be with hand or something, you know. It yeah. Will, I mean, there will be a lot of uh, bleeding. Yes, ma'am. So whether you uh, allow, if the first fetus is lower down, you allow a medical method and it expels. After that also, you will have to you these exactly cases by any means they are yeah difficult. so okay. and i really think that it has to uh, be according to the you know patient clinical right. according to the, the yeah and clinical situation of bleeding, we have to go for yeah yeah definitely so I uh, think uh, Dr. Ranjana, everywhere I think in with every case we have to customize we have to yes, go to the patient yes. 
it has to be tailor made the treatment has to be tailor made it uh, one size amazing. will not fit all that is definite i have a question uh, just in case as you mentioned that sometimes we accidentally encounter a molar pregnancy along with uh, a normal fetus in case of a cesarean section perhaps so any special uh, points that we have to take care of in that case if we are doing a c section okay so we have taken out the baby we have taken out the products as ma'am mentioned we need suction how do we suction there i think when you are doing a a cesarean then the things are much easier because you just remove the baby and remove all the products and you can do a blunt curettage then curettage is used. yeah you can do a blunt curettage okay. and if you find really a, a molar then again you can go with that the gentle curettage and send that to yes. pathology yes, yes. so that you further our follow up can be done accordingly yeah and this case might require even that that same follow up will re be required by the beta true true so uh, that finishes our panel and i think uh, we had lovely panelists on board and so uh, wonderful experts as well so it thank was uh, fun moderating you, the panel <laughs> thank you so much ma'am all thank the cases were very interested you, and uh, thank you so much ma'am thank you we have many queries in the chat box but uh -huh. we have discussed all the issues but there was one question it was asked by dr madhuri mishra she is saying if we are doing suction evacuation for a molar pregnancy in the g3 p2 plus 0 patient can we do the tubectomy in the same setting or we should wait for uh, uh, some time for before tubectomy we actually if the patient is stable we can do it in the same sitting there is no harm there is no harm yeah uh, if the patient is hemodynamically yeah. stable yes yes he's yes, not bled a lot because if she has bled a lot then i would like to defer the ligation since like i said thing have you taken the consent before and or yes. not you can't Nothing. take a decision of the ligation on the table if you have taken no. a prior consent only then you can even then think yeah it. even no uh, consent at the table no but kiran if they have given a consent also but even if the patient is you. not stable and she has bled a lot i would not like to do it yes, because nobody should Definitely. do it yeah. not only you it should not be done because yeah. the ligation uh, complications are considered in different way even mortalities they have to be dealt with in a different exactly way. so there so it is wise to defer the the vaccine should always be done when the patient is stable yeah. when there are yeah. other complications the patient has to be all right then only think about ligation better avoid it in high risk cases better ah. is explain them later on take the consent and then do it exactly may i add one thing dr ranjana Why not? I will. I will never. I will never advise to vet me because these cases, if something wrong goes afterwards, yes. they ah. claim. Yes. They claim yes. for the of uh, course compensation. compensation. And the of government, has, the government has clearly ordered this thing. That even in cesarean cases, the high risk cases, if something wrong happens, if you just do the tubex, the tubex will be blamed. You, uh, you just definitely. So that is what I was saying. Now that if the patient yeah. is. Has bled a lot. She is yeah. not hemodynamically stable. Just defer it, even yeah. if they have requested yeah. you for life. After that, look, the patient is very chalak. Don't think much for them. Ah. First thing, for if 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 You do it, but they don't don't show it. We don't want the number of tubes to be done because it was so much compensation at that time that we had to go to court every day. Then it was a real problem for us. So the, yeah. that's why, uh, yeah. इतना सोचने के मरीज के बारे में जरूरत नहीं है. पहले अपने बारे में सोचिए फिर. और क्या? बिल्कुल दोनों के बारे में सोचना चाहिए वी हैव टू थिंक अबाउट द पेशेंट बट वी आल्सो हैव टू कंसीडर आर सेल्फ आर सेफ्टी शुड आल्सो बी देयर बिल्कुल वन थिंग रंजना जी वन थिंग बिफोर 12 वीक्स इन कंप्लीट वेसिकुलर मोर दिस अकॉर्डिंग टू आरसीओजी एंड अमेरिकन गाइडलाइंस इन आरएच नेगेटिव पेशेंट देयर इज नो नीड ऑफ गिविंग एंटीडीज यू नो नीला इज अ कंप्लीट मोर कंप्लीट हाँ कम्प्लीट मोल ना तो कम्प्लीट मोल वहां डायग्नोज हो जाता है यहाँ पे नहीं डायग्नोज हो पाता ना बाय द टाइम यू डायग्नोज सेवेंटी टू आवर्स विल हैव लैप्स्ड 
and then you may unnecessarily not give. It's safer to give a, uh, an antibody yeah. rather than to withhold the antibody. I think on this, uh, it's uh, simple. Uh, complete mole, ma'am. Ultrasound may diagnose ho jayega. Complete ho partial ho ka ho jayega. That's ho kabhi kabhi thoda sa tissue hota hai na fetal tissue. But agar ham ek mota mota leke chale ki ham complete man kar agar chal rahe hain. तो जैसे बाकी अबॉर्शंस में लेस देन फर्स्ट ट्रिमेस्टर में हम लोग फिफ्टी की बात करते हैं और उसके बाद थ्री हंड्रेड की बात हंड्रेड हंड्रेड हाँ नो हियर वी आर फॉलोइंग दैट फिफ्टी एंड थ्री हंड्रेड ओनली हंड्रेड एंड हंड्रेड हंड्रेड वन फिफ्टी का मिलता है वन फिफ्टी इज अवेलेबल थ्री हंड्रेड इज अवेलेबल बस वन फिफ्टी आफ्टर अबॉर्शन एंड थ्री हंड्रेड आफ्टर डिलीवरी और सीजर रोगैम वालों का माइक्रोगैम सो एनी पहले आता था निशा अब इट्स नॉट कमिंग नाउ ओके मैम मे बी फॉर सम टाइम एनी वे पॉइंट वॉट डॉक्टर नीलम सेट दैट सो लाइक डायग्नोजिंग कम्प्लीट मोल By 12 weeks should be all right. I mean, mostly we will do. So less than 12. पर उन्होंने जो मना किया है probably is just the dose that is too less that we are giving in the normal pregnancy also. But I don't think there is any harm also if. There is no harm. And Nilam, another thing is there. Another thing is there. कि बाद में अगर कोई problem हो जाती है related to that, then you will be put to blame that you knew the patient is Rh negative. And you know RCOG says that, but there are many authorities who say give it. ये न्यूजीलैंड गाइडलाइंस ऑस्ट्रेलियन गाइडलाइंस कहते हैं कि टिश्यू हो गया और जिसमे एंटीजन वो डी एंटीजन है तो फिर पेशेंट को तो सेंसिटाइजेशन हो ही जाएगा वो ये देना चाहिए कि बेटर आई मीन इट्स ऑलवेज बेटर टू गिव इट एक्टली बिकॉज आपको लेटर ऑन हिस्टोपैथोलॉजी में फाइनल कंफर्मेशन होगा एक्जैक्टली देर इज नो हार्म सो इट्स ऑलवेज अरे बाद में वो सब्सिक्वेंट प्रेगनेंसी में जाना चाहिए वो ये जानना चाहिए कि इट शुड बी गिवन इट शुड बी गिवन बिकॉज सब्सिक्वेंट प्रेगनेंसी में अगर दिक्कत हो जाती है देन एग्जैक्टली द्लेम इज गूगल पढ़ के कुछ भी निकाल लेंगे आप उनको एक्सप्लेन करते रहिए ये इतना था ये इतना था इट्स नॉट वेरी एक्सपेंसिव ऑल्सो नाउ ना डेढ़ सौ वाला तो आराम से तो आरसीओजी वगैरह ना इन लोग के गाइडलाइंस बड़े स्ट्रिंजेंट होते हैं बिकॉज वहां पे वो लोग सब कुछ डायग्नोज कर लेते हैं ना Because And RCOG says because complete mole does not have fetal tissue per head. Ah, so plastic yeah. tissue. Yeah. No fetal tissue. Yeah. But then you have to diagnose that it is a complete mole, na? Yeah. That yeah. is the thing. And even if you diagnose it on USG, the confirmation will only be on histopathology. Histopathology. Yeah. Histopathology may take time. That is why it has to be. It should be better. It is better to give. In a nutshell, Neelam, it's better to give than to not give. थैंक सारे एकदम रटे रटाए बैठे थे बिकॉज किरण ने ये तक इन लोग को बोला था की टेंशन मत लो एग्जाम नहीं है आराम से पढ़ना This is for the first time that Thank a panel you, seems like you know, and I mean, why is it being portrayed like an exam? No, you know, Dr. Nisha, Dr. Nisha, do you know? Yes, all of them have been read. Like Dr. Nisha, I was saying that I have made a cox academy group. These slides are very few people who are not able to make them. So, I will put all of them in the main main. I will also put them in the main main. So, I will also put them in the main main. So, I will also put them in the main main. So, I will also put them in the main main. So, I will also put them in the main main. So, I will also put them in the main main. So, I will also put them Be relaxed, आराम से पढ़ो एग्जाम नहीं है मतलब दिस इज नॉट एन एग्जाम जो नहीं आएगा वो रंजना जी है बताने के लिए 
periphery they do they do not do a scan they do not do a histopath they do not do anything one dnc two dnc ah. three dnc patients bleeding coming this is one contrast where they do not just think about gtt and there is another contrast which is developing in my hospital that every patient who comes even if it is a spontaneous abortion the residents and i'm talking to this here because lot of residents must be listening recent emergencies only you know every patient they will label as gtd you know it is such a contrast so you have to really understand put them into the criteria because this generation is developing on you know another extreme also so we have to really balance it so I try and understand the true. True guidelines and the true criteria fit into this don't jump into conclusions वो तुरंत कीमो चढ़ा देना है या तुरंत हमको ये कर देना ये रॉन्ग है टेक योर टाइम मैनेज आई मीन फिट इन टू द क्राइटेरिया देन ओनली लेबल एज जी टी एन एंड बेटर टू सेंड इट टू पीपल हु सी देम मोर ऑफ एन एंड आई डू एग्री विद डॉक्टर and if you don't get any product or conception then the tissue must must be sent for histopathological examination yeah. that is must or in these cases they undergo undiagnosed most of the times especially the cases which are coming from from very very mm -hmm. they, they don't have that entity in the mind they ek get mm -hmm. out the dnc ka nahi kya isliye ne kiya to this is this becomes a problem yeah. just before the vote of thanks our uh, sales manager from uh, UP would like to just address the gathering, please. He's Thank our zone sales manager. Thank you, Kiran Ji. Wonderful manager. program you have organized. Thank Mujhe you. Thank 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 you. As a member of the Central Assembly, I am so really proud that we are continuously working in the direction of new policies here. We have seen up three indigenous developers, not only that, but just from ten different areas. We have developed a new way of doing it. Quite cost with treatment that is only fifty rupees per time. Then by directing the specific group to implement the policy and setting up the program. One of the requests to be very supportive of the quality development. For a seven mother journey of the mother, our other excellent brand and well-known brand maintain is available. That is Progesterone Seventeen Alpha Hydroxy Progesterone Tablet, two fifty and five hundred milligram, and also available Maintain Tablet, that is Alan Strong five milligram tablet. With this, we have lighter with Sachet also available. This complication price for Tencia, IGR, and all the hundred milligrams. That is the brand of. Uh, Well, as in, as well as lycopene and uh, DHA. So, requesting for your valuable support for our brands, and please join us again in this Saturday for webinar on fertility update. To register now, please note down our webinar ID display. Thank you very much. Over to organizer for word of thanks as we conclude the program for today. Thank ah, you. Ah, Kiran Ji. Okay, Kiran Ji, one more interruption. Sorry, uh, our sub respected senior system is. Uh, we are going to organize IAG on 14th and 15th May. So, आप लोगों से प्लीज रिक्वेस्ट है कि अपने उस एरिया से ज्यादा ज्यादा कैंडिडेट और सारे उनका रजिस्ट्रेशन रंजना जी आपको बुला रहे हैं स्पेशल prophylactic really it is good so what is what is sir nisha i don't be used uh, kiran with carbitocin the contraction is very very very, very strong na strong and uh. iv to bilkul hi na do 
अगर देना है आई एम दो एंड आई एम कोई खास फायदा नहीं करता इट हैज टू बी गिवन आई वी एंड देन द कंट्रेक्शन ऑफ द यूट्रस इज लाइक इट बिकम्स अ क्रिकेट बॉल इट बिकम्स सो हार्ड शर्मा मैम and uh, dr uma singh ma'am who could not join today our experts for the panel dr kiran pandey ma'am and dr nisha ma'am and our wonderful moderator dr anjana khanna ma'am and dr parul khanna and our esteemed all the panelists who have worked very hard for this panel and uh, last but not the least a very great a very heartfelt thanks to dr kiran sinha ma'am for organizing and taking all the pains for conduct such webinars and informative webinars for society i am very thankful to dr neela mishra ma'am under her presidency we are able to conduct such valuable webinars for our society members and i am also thankful to dr veena avasthi also who was with us through all the this webinar and I'm very thankful to uh, our farmer friends dr deepika and vinod ji from uh, jackson lycorad jackson pharma for their valuable support thank you so much thank you thank you namaskar